So on a plane, he could just on a plane, he would he would arrange entire orchestras. He did all, he did uh, Georgia and all the strings he did without even not even at a piano, just like in his head, Fuck. doing this. Hello, everyone. Hola, mis amigos. You're listening to Oh My God, Hi, Hijo de Dios. Hola, with me, George Lopez. Porque sabes que let's do the show. Porque I got a lot of things to do. Thing I got to go that dry cleaner here by Kid Phelps. Se pegó la cabeza. I got to go get some Neo Spor Sporin Paul. You know who George is? Oh, I'm sure he's around here somewhere. What's his name? George. Lopez. George Lopez. Oh my God. OMG. OMG. Hi. Oh my God. Hi. Um, you do it at your house because of the OCD? Yeah. Well, it helps. Still or not? No, no let's not talk then. All right. Oh, great. Um, to the good stuff. You want to introduce our guest? Uh, yeah, today on the podcast, we have comedian and podcaster Rick Glassman, known for the Take Your Shoes Off podcast, uh, as well as actor, had a long career, but uh, what show I'll are stop you on? there. You're on, show, you're on NBC, right? You're on NBC. Uh, it, I, what, years ago. It was called Undateable. And uh, that ended a while ago, and, uh, and now I'm here. How, um, how long did it? Three what, years? Uh, what was it? Uh, it was about, about millennials dating? I, I think yeah, I guess I don't know. Uh, yeah, it was I, millenni- I mean, I don't know if millennials, but I guess technically we were all millennials. Yeah, mm-hmm. it was just about a, a bunch of uh, guys and girls dating on a multicam, and you know. And you guys like made the switch to doing a live show, like partway through the run of it, right? It was initially pre-taped and yeah. then it became live. Yeah, we did uh, uh, the third season. We did it all live, so we did an East Coast and then a West Coast oh, wow. live taping, and that was cool and. I don't know why, but I feel like who gives a shit. With know? the other, no, <laughs> no. I think it's OCD because you're like next. The uh, uh, you know what? There is there is definitely a control thing on me because I'm used to doing my own. That's and it's right. like let's move on to the next thing. That's right. I'll let you tell me when to. I move learned on. from Bob and Tom. I learned from the best. What did um, you learn about that? I could pick that up from you about people trying to yeah move to the next thing. So did you know the other actors in the show? Yeah. A lot of them were, I mean, I... Did you present the show to them or, or you met them? I was the cast day? on it. Okay. So uh, Bill Lawrence, uh, who did Scrubs and Ted Lasso, yeah. he uh, cast me and my uh, comedian buddy Brent Morin. I'm not sure if you guys know Brent. Very funny stand-up. Yeah. And then cast uh, just a whole bunch of stand-up comics and people and we were all, I mean, Brent and then John and Allison, who were writers on the show, and I all lived in the same building. And then that was our all of our first that was job. It. Okay. Yeah, that's pretty good. Did, did, so you had to go through the process of like auditioning, then you get a call back, and then kinda. I didn't have an agent. I was I was just doing stand up, and I met Bill at a show. Bill and Brent <laughs> met, uh, invited Brent to the improv. Bill saw us perform, and then just said, "Will you come audition for us?" So mm-hmm. it was pretty, like you, and you easy. had to go through the studio heads and yeah. the, and the whole thing. Yeah, but he kind of walked us through it. It was like mm-hmm. a, it was like a he had who he liked, and he said, yeah. "These are the guys I like," and then I'm gonna. Yeah, make sure they get through that. It was an experience that that uh, made it seem like it was easier than it was, you know. And then after that show, it was five more years before I, I booked another show, my first job since, and uh, you know. Yeah, you know, you know that's an interesting thing because, um, you know, man, you could be on a show like that, and then the show's over, and then you know, one day you're you're out of a show one day, and then you're out of a show a month, then you're out of a show a year. Then you're out of a show five years, and then you haven't got another show. You start worrying. And then everybody starts to see you, and then you know it's like, You okay, Rick? You're on the other <laughs> side. You all right, bud? And they start going like, hey, man, you know, what are you working on? Well, I, you know, I haven't had that show since the other one from back there, but, you know. So I'm, what's this new show about? It's called uh, As We See It. It's Jason Kadam's show. Uh, he did Parenthood, Friday Night Lights. It's an adaptation of an Israeli show that was called On the Spectrum, and it's about three autistic um, young 20-somethings trying to date, have a personal life, hold a job. You know, in the days of, uh, before we got politically correct, is on the spectrum, is that would have been an insulting term when I was growing up? When? You think so? Saying on the spectrum? Yeah. On the spectrum means that somebody may be autistic. Is oh, autistic. I, is aut- yeah, is yeah, autistic. Yeah. It's the autism spectrum. Yeah. I'd never heard of On the autism Shouldn't spectrum. Shouldn't they say he's in the spectrum? I don't know what they I think you're on it. The only spectrum I know is the one I get on TV. A spectrum is more like a trampoline than a bath. You're on a trampoline. You're in a bath. Very well done. Thank you. (laughs) We'll be right back. So, yeah. We'll we'll, 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 Ah! we'll, we'll tighten it up. (laughs) We'll we'll put the (laughs) pre-roll in there. (laughs) (laughs) That's right. So, so, uh, have you seen that show on the spectrum on uh, Netflix? 
Love on the spectrum. It's yeah, just good. finished the second season yeah. last night. It's awesome, huh? Boy, are my arms tired. <laughs> but yeah, it's a good show. Yeah, the guy and the guy's like very polite. It's like the. Yeah, well, they, uh, a lot of times, a lot of traits with autism are uh, not picking up some of the social cues and kind of the, the what, what's the word, platitudes, like the things that are more intuitive you learn to do. So it's cute and fun to see people, like you could tell they learn to do that thing, and then it becomes, like language becomes the way you act. You start using certain words, you start behaving a certain way. Right. And like them saying, this is so lovely, and this is such a romantic thing we're doing. And then it becomes a romantic thing because that's the intention, and it's, right. it's really cool to watch. You know, yeah, yeah, it, it is interesting because sometimes it works, and they're very honest. Like, if they weren't on the spectrum, and if somebody was that honest, I think people would be taken, if you were on a date, I think people would be, I can't believe you would say that. Because it's, it's very honest. But they understand each other because honesty, they don't lie. Yes. Isn't that, that program The Good Doctor is based upon? He's an autistic doctor. Is he? I, I yeah. think so, yeah. That's the yes. Idea. Yes. And he is brutally honest. Like that. Yeah, you should see uh, the scenes. They cut him usually, but he does those a few scenes where he's giving a physical to people and he just calls out, uh, like, you got a little dick and all these things where he's just like really <laughs> I'm serious. It was a, before they made it because they wanted to add some jokes. Yeah. He talks about how little people's dicks are and how... No, I'm just joking. <laughs> it's, it's a pretty good show. We we watch it religiously. My my wife and I, yeah. I enjoy. It That's so. what that show was about. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. about an autistic doctor who talks about uh, you know like uh, tiny dicks. little dicks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. LDDS. So so are you are you you're, you're not an only child? I'm not. Yes. Why'd you say it so confidently? I came across as a not only child. Oh, you know, I'm not I'm still trying to work on. I'm still trying to work on it. You did it like that's what you do. You go. You did it like you were guessing my weight. Like you had an idea. I'm not an only child, right? Yeah, I have an older brother. He lives. He lives here, and uh, we're both from Cleveland. Are you guys? Had, uh, yeah. Are you guys both uh, uh, OCD? Oh no, 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 no. I am. He's uh, how do you more think, narcissistic. How do you, is your, is your, are your parents? Were your parents? Yeah, my my mom is. Um, so I'm a. Uh, I'm like, I'm wondering how much I'm censoring myself because there's things I don't love talking about too much because I, I've talked about it on my podcast a bit, but I think it's okay to talk about. And here we are. Well, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm interested because, I mean, um, I would have to say in the years that I was doing stand-up, like we, if someone had, they, if they were quirky, they would say, hey, this, dude, this dude's quirky. They were probably OCD or on the spectrum. Yeah. And then and a guy would have props and he would use very deliberate language. You know, and, and he would be like, this is a ray gun that I bought at the store, and it goes like it makes a funny noise. And then he would That's do it. That's a good it. autistic impression. And then he would, the light, red light would go on, and everybody would be rolling. This guy walking down the street with a fucking ray gun. You thought it was just for his act, but as you see him leave the club, he's walking up the street with a fucking ray gun. I got into props recently, George. <laughs> not George. No, George, I did. I got into props recently. Puppets. I'm not joking. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. You know what? The... I can't believe that you would put your hand in a puppet. Not knowing where the puppet had been, like that what, material. Wh why do you think I don't know where my puppet has been? Okay. Oh, oh, so you, <laughs> I'm in a monogamous relationship <laughs> with this puppet. A lot of people say, can I see your puppet? I go, you, you can go, see it. You can't touch it. Don't you put can't your, put your hand in it. No. Because that thing, you'd be like, listen, man, you fuck my puppet. Yeah, yeah, seriously, you got to get it tested. I don't do that. It's my own puppet. But yeah, but there's a judgment for props. And I had it too for a while. Why do you think there's a judgment problem? They think it's e they think it's easier. It's not easier. It's, it's not easier. The judgment is because it's, it's basically saying you can't do it on your own. Mm -hmm. it's oh. it's it's people being like it's basically uh i feel like uh props are performance enhancing drugs for the comedy world it's like yeah he hit it well, 500 said. feet i don't know anything about baseball but uh that would be good he did, he did it with a puppet <laughs> you know let's see what he does without a puppet but i got into props i got into props because i have props i mean we all have props you know look at everything's a prop yeah yeah and i just thought it'd be silly to do and then just kind of playing with props and just playing with like the idea of what the expectations people have are for props. And it was getting laughs, and I'm like, this is funny, but I can't keep doing this. And I'm like, why? Why am I? Uh, but I think at some point, you would, if you turn the corner, you're not gonna, you wouldn't put it down. Like, you're like, I, I'm You're saying get, relying on it? I'm, no, connected to it. I'm so, say that different, I don't know what you mean. Uh, 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 if you have the, if you're, if you're enjoying it and they're laughing, and then part of you is like, oh, I could do it without it. But you enjoy doing it, it's, it, it, it's fun. It's not, I don't think it's a, you know, I think the guys that did props gave gave prop comedy um, that stigma that you know you're doing it because you can't do it without it. You came from a time when multicams were 
or the the comedy. Mm -hmm. And then they did this, and now they're coming this way a little bit. But it's almost like people judge the genre, but your show isn't the same as another multicam, right. just because it's multicam. But people have expectations of what they think something is. And to me, that's a really fun thing to play with and manipulate, because now I have a built-in callback. The, you already have, everybody in the room feels a certain way, so I could now right. do it different, you know? and. The problem is carrying on puppets, you know, on a plane because it's an expensive <laughs> puppet and having this, you know, a mustache budget. Dude, I wasn't even planning on it. I just did a show on this the other night. I have so many mustaches, George. <laughs> <laughs> for, for the listening audience, he just pulled a mustache. I have out so of his many pocket. mustaches. <laughs> and before I discovered the sticky side tape, weekends were costing me 50 bucks in mustaches. But I got good, I got good mustache bits. Ha, uh, and, and is that mustache, did you make it yourself or, or is it? No, no, no. You got a cinema secret or something like that? Like you go buy 10 of them? I think Oz, is that what it's called? There's yes. A, Oz? Oz has good. We should get. We'll be right back. If you're on the spectrum, if you're on the spectrum, Oz, <laughs> Oz is like a nightclub. It's like a, it's, not, it's almost like if you went to a club and you'd be like, man, there's a lot of chicks in this club. Yeah. Oz, if you're on the spectrum, you'd be like, fuck, look at over there, look at yeah. there. They got like, eyebrows. Like, is that a goblin mask? A fucking pinwheel, like, <laughs> the, the, the fucking hat goes up and goes back down. Like, it's right. Yeah. You can find a fucking shirt from Alf, fucking that show Alf, and you're like, what the fucking Alf shirt? <laughs> It's Y'all, the best place. They love Alf shirts. Where is this place? Alf yeah, is I've never heard at of one point, and well, no, probably still. Alf was a bigger hit in Mexico than my show. You know, he's starting sure. a podcast. Alf. The, the, no, the, 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 <laughs> there's one in Hollywood and there's one in Burbank. There's one near here. You know what? How about how about this? And we play it by ear, or we play it by upper lip. <laughs> After this, we'll go we'll get some mustaches. My treat. All right. Uh, <laughs> next episode, I want you wearing. <laughs> yeah. So, how, how does the mustache play in the, in your act? I'll tell you after. It's it's my closer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. I got a good mustache bit, though. Uh, you know, I was with this guy, Jesse Aragon. He used to work at the comedy mm-hmm. store, friend with Paul Rodriguez years ago. And we drove up to a gig up in Santa Maria. And uh, as we were driving, he, he he had some props. He was a Mexican dude. He had the oranges, right? So he has this bag, and he's been opening up the bag. He's taking out, like, a, you know, a fucking wig. And he's taking out, a, 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 like, the push the thing, and they clap, you know. And a fucking helmet with the two things, and then he pulls. Even out. that, you rolled your eyes. People hate props, uh, dude. You see, <laughs> and then uh, uh, and then he pulls out this fucking deformed bag of oranges, like they're all black in one part, and they crunch. You know, they get squishy and they smell. And I said, "Oh man, what's that?" And he goes, "Oh fuck, I haven't worked in a couple of weeks, man. <laughs> fuck, I forgot these oranges were in there, so we have to go to the market and buy some more oranges before we get to the club." And I said, "What do you do, man? You like buy oranges every time you have a gig?" He goes, "Yeah." I said, "Why don't you just paint some fucking tennis balls orange?" <laughs> And just keep the bag. And he he couldn't understand it. He was like, "What?" Well, so if I have, so if I, okay, so if I paint the, if I paint the tennis balls orange and I put them in the orange bag with the holes in it, they're gonna think that they're. I said, "Yeah, then you have to fuck around and buy, buy uh, oranges." Plus, he, he, didn't he has he has a fun uh, item for merch. <laughs> he sells right. oranges. I try to write around merch. <laughs> <laughs> you know it's t- it's tough. But writing around merch is uh, I've never heard anybody say. Oh, that. I was just joking. No, but you could. Dudes, dudes do that. Big Dunlop, oh, yeah. you man. Big Dunlop. Uh, uh, God rest his soul. He's a funny guy. He had eyes that he had the the bugged out eyes, and he would sell eyes. Um, two of them for like five dollars, and people would put them in. He put them at the end. He goes, I'll be back there selling eyes. He sold eyes for like twenty years, made millions of million dollars, and then one time the IRS. Went to the show and said, hey, man, you, what do you do with this money? It's all the cash business, buddy. <laughs> yeah. Like the guy's the IRS. Yeah. A lot of puns there. IRS, eyes on you, selling eyes. <laughs> we'll workshop it. But <laughs> there's something about coming in here that I'm feeling now because I haven't left the house. I don't leave the house much um, since this pandemic started. Maybe we'll get into that. But the reason is it was tough for a little bit. And then I kind of got into this rotation. And. And I do my podcast at home, and that's kind of my social life. Somebody comes over once a week. That was enough. I'll see somebody in the next week. Um, so now I'm coming out of the house. I just started doing stand-up again a month ago. I'm coming in here with someone who I've never met before, but I've known for a very long time. And there's this weird, there's like, you want to find the pocket. Are you looking at us like when, like when Total Recall, like when Arnold Schwarzenegger looked at somebody and like you could... It just goes, mm. like, they re, you read Two them. weeks. Mm. <laughs> Two <laughs> weeks. <laughs> no, but, like... But I, it is. this is when you haven't met somebody, it's hard to kind of just start 
and and try to get yeah. a uh, a vibe going. And not even in a bad way, just by design, it's what it is. Yeah. But like somebody like you are in a, a you know you're in a power position. You know, not only is it your show, you're George Lopez. And I'm wondering if you recognize that with guests, because you probably have guests on often that you've never met before. Right. We, we started to have some, yeah. But I don't, I don't, I don't feel like that. I don't, I don't feel like it. You like, don't feel like what? Like, like I, like I'm different than anybody. Like, you know, you come in, I don't feel like I have, even to myself, uh, uh, anything attached to myself, like of, of stand up or the show or whatever. I just feel like I come in here and I'm just myself. Yeah, but but still but still I know you and you don't know me. Right. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. do you ever do you ever rec Cuz I'm wondering this with my podcast. Do you ever recognize somebody's energy? Like when do you when do you get to know somebody on an interview versus having a conversation? Does that make sense? Does that make sense? I'm still, I'm still back here with OCD. I don't. He's know still OCD trying is. to spell it. You don't know what OCD is? <laughs> no, I don't. compulsive. Yes, I know what it is. Like, like if you, well, my daughter's in the room. I don't try <laughs> and you figure couldn't... anybody out. I just, I, I'm just here. I'm waiting for him to say, you know, he didn't. Like what they say, you can't eat just one chip. That probably would have fucking started put people in people's heads. Like maybe you want yeah. one fucking potato chip, and then they tell you you can't eat just one, and yeah. then you eat a bag, and then I can eat more than one, and then it gets you yeah. gone. <laughs> and then you, you hold the whole thing, but yeah. Has anybody had a chip? No. No. Never. Oh, well, you know what? There's that chip challenge. I think you should sell... A chip? <laughs> Is that what you're going to say? <laughs> yeah, just, just one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they have that uh, spicy chip. Do you know that, that, that chip like, challenge Shaq did? Like Shaq ate yeah, I was oh, yeah. on inside that. Yeah, like yeah. Dorito that makes everybody, puts like everybody in a bad mood. thing, yeah. yeah. Oh, is it a ghost pepper one? Something like that. Some crazy hot pepper. It's a single chip. You eat it. Could you eat that. it? I don't know. My, my aunt told me that Bobby Lee did the hot wings and he shit in his pants. <laughs> oh, he, he shit on himself. I don't know if that was the same day. I think he just, I think he just shit himself. <laughs> no, he did, huh? He, he, yeah, he, he was hot doing the hot wing yeah. challenge. <laughs> and hot and on, uh, on hot ones. He shit himself on hot yeah. ones? No, he didn't. Yeah, he did. Trent and you And you could, you could hear, like... Right. Yeah. You can hear his stomach go, and I'm, my is like, that's his stomach. I'm like, there's no way that's his stomach. It's so fucking loud. And he's like, oh. Oh. And this fucking shit, he shit himself. I mean, I think we found the answer. I think we found, I think we found, and this, you know, this guy caught the Night Stalker. That technique. Okay, the Night Stalker came out to see what the fucking guy's laughing at. God, I got him. Oh, that's Can you, funny. I mean, is it a ma uh, crazy that Gil caught that's the fucking Night Stalker, <laughs> Richard Ramirez? What does that mean? You know Richard Ramirez, the Night Stalker from the 80s? I don't know anything, dude. You don't know that? I'm, I don't know anything. Serial killer from okay. Los Angeles, from El Paso, came out here and started to break into people's homes, women mostly, and uh, kill him, and writing like pentagrams on the wall and all that stuff. And So he's still trying to figure out, hey, George, you're here. What's the fat guy here for? <laughs> wait, wait, but wait, is this a joke that I'm not getting? Or did no, you really no, no, say real? This How'd is, you catch him? What'd you do? Did you grab him? <laughs> no, no. I was the lead investigator. He killed 14 people locally. We tracked him down. He was caught and we prosecuted him. Oh, I feel like we shouldn't be laughing this hard during this story. <laughs> oh, oh, God. <laughs> killed 14 <laughs> women. <laughs> I got him, though. I got the son I of a bitch. I my Ted Bundy fucking stories. <laughs> wow. Mm. I don't never really know when to use this saying, but small world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Good so, to be back. Good to be back. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, so, okay, so I, I, I get what you're saying. Yeah, you know, like... But dating is not easy. It, it can't be. That's a pro transition it right can't there. Be. Um, <clears throat> you no. know, in, 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 in stand-up, I don't really segue. I just changed it. it was yeah, but, but that was an organic, like, oh, meeting people is, is uncomfortable, dating. I don't want to lean into this. I'm just, I was making more of a joke, but that but was I a good segue. But I think if you segue. go to the grocery store, everything out of everything out of your comfort zone, which would be your house, um, is difficult for you. No, it's not. Have you, ever, have you ever driven by a place and then not got out because you convinced yourself? Not Once to I'm out there? of the house, I'm You're I'm fine. all right. I'm all right. So you talk yourself out of going out. Yeah, because going back into the house, a lot of rituals, a lot of things. Mm -hmm. I have to change my clothes, clean my glasses, put do a lot of stuff that. Um, I've got to a point in a good way, not I'd love to get better, but I got to a place where... God, I don't where, even know what Gail's going on. Were you laughing right laugh at my obstacles or all the women that uh, died? No. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even change my calzones that often. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
Oh, that's, that's all right. So no, no. I'm the type of guy that would wash his orange peels before he before he peeled them. (laughs) No, no. Well, yeah. Um, But I I got to the point to where in my house is where I control. That's where it's like if you come in, sit on the blanket. You know what I mean? Yeah. But once I leave, it's more like just regular OCD. Just like don't touch me, but let's have a conversation. Uh, Yeah. And you know, people sometimes are just touchy by nature. They come and put their hand on your back. Horrible hip hop band. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. yeah. Right. Hip hop by nature. Touchy by nature. Well, uh, yeah, I'm a touchy by nature. I I do touch a lot of people. Touchy by nature had the guy with the little arms. No rapper, the third guy with with little arms. T Rex, they called him. The little T Rex guy. Yeah. (laughs) But but yeah, when people come up to somebody, they go, "Hey, we've never met," and they that's not good. You know, my, my podcast has been doing pretty well recently, and it started doing well during the pandemic. So only recently is the first time I started doing shows again since I had this podcast, and for the first time ever, I'm getting recognized. And people are coming up to me, even with my mask on, but they know me at least somewhat. It is very cool because they come up to me, they go, hey, Rick, and they already kind of know the rules. Can I take a picture? But like, I'll stand and they know, and I love it. I mean, it's flattering. It's my first time I've experienced people knowing and liking me Mm -hmm. without me meeting them. But then for them to, for me to have this thing about me where they stay away, it's like, I think that's cool. That's the same way Howie Mandel is. Yeah. Howie Mandel is the same way. Don't touch me. Can't shake my hand. But what's the, what is this? Like, I have things that are like, I know it's a bit irrational, but like, why are we, why do I need to touch you? What is, the, I know the origins of sword fighting or whatever, but why are we all doing this? No. <laughs> nobody ever, nobody ever did that. They used to have a space and then we, we came in a position at a time where people would hug and kiss when they met or they haven't seen somebody in a long time, they would hug them. And I think it just became kind of a. I grew up like that. They're, they're, my family was. Huggy Body Kissy Face. But Huggy, Huggy Body Kissy Face, by the way, another great hip-hop album, <laughs> is uh, with family and people you love. I'm talking about, like, people that... Strangers. Yeah, you don't, mm-hmm. I don't need to touch... You don't need to touch me. I just don't get it. Uh, why is that? What do you think? I mean, I think the goal for it is ultimately to be disarming. It's to sort of uh, decrease any tension, like, hey, you know, I'm... Decrease tension by squeezing my shoulders? But well, you, could, you couldn't go to the car wash and everyone. have somebody sit in your car and drive, drive it out and then dry it, right? I mean, I think that's... If I had to. But I would... Like, when I go somewhere to valet, and that's the only option I can't park, I'll do it. But I'll... I'll hey, man. Do you mind if I park it? And no, keep I know. The keys, I'll pay you now. It can't be easy. No. But it's... We all have our obstacles, and, uh, uh, you know... What did I, you What did you first... I, I, you know, it's funny, man, because, you know, sometimes people just are just a bit removed, and... Going out or driving by places, people won't go in because they're like, eh, you know, I don't. Removed. What do you mean? Uh, like if somebody's pri- like a, like private. I spend a lot of time by myself. I spend a lot of time alone, and um, I've gone to places where they were expecting me, and then I didn't go in. I was just like, okay, I don't feel it. Is this a, like a, expecting you like, like a performance type of thing? No, I I did it at a at a gig one time. I went to this place, and I, you know, I had pretty good intuition. And uh, oh, you just felt it was wrong. I just felt it was wrong in my. I just didn't feel like it was gonna. Could you give an example of what that means? What you're driving, and then something happens into your well, first body. Of all, first of all, we're all more comfortable in a, in our own setting, like at a club, you know. So doing something outside in the street, they used to try to do fairs and all that stuff, where you're just like, I'm out of the, I'm out of the comfort zone. That's mm-hmm. everybody's comfort zone. Is for a musician, a musician could play in the park, but a comedian is difficult because you. It's, it's unnatural, like from what from no what, walls. too much going yeah. on around around yeah. you, yeah. where yeah. you don't have control. And then sometimes you know that a lot was of murders. A, that was an outside place at somebody's house where they would some guys would do it and some guys wouldn't. And I got this thing to do it, and I, I, I got there and I looked around and I was like, hey, "Fuck this, man!" And bail. What's what? what uh, you're connecting that to the to, having a hard time, like uh, going out. Like we were saying, um, about like parking. I think everything is fine until you see something in your own self that says, nah, "I don't think I'm gonna." Yeah, I don't. I don't I'm not. I'm not feeling. You know, it. sometimes with with obsessive compulsive disorder, uh, it, it's uh, it's a it's, you know, everyone there's different thoughts behind this, and and everyone connects them in different ways, but it's mostly a thing of control where you couldn't control things in your life in some way, so you're trying to control other ways by touching and. Maybe if I do this, then this won't happen, or this will happen, right? So this form of control to where it was bad as a kid, bad. Um, I would be taking my, it would take me five minutes to get a sock on because no, it's, you know, you're trying to, 
and then you, you grow up and you, you kind of, the adult in you recognizes that like, this is irrational, this is illogical, these are learned behaviors, this is something that you feel anxious, but you, you, in order to get past it, you have to get past it and just touch the thing once and leave type of thing, right? I spent years, pardon me, I spent years trying to understand what is a feeling that's negative versus uh, maybe this is good instincts. And I got to a point a few years ago where I was a lot better. You could have come over and sat on my couch. I'll make you take your shoes off and wash your hands. That's always a thing for me. Okay, right. But like then you're in and it's fine. Um, when the pandemic happened, all of these things that were irrational, wash your hands, wash your oranges, don't do this, you know, don't hug, don't... All these things that I've been like parenting myself, Ricky, it's okay, where it was almost the kid was like, I told you, you know, like right. you don't do any of that, don't leave. So then I got so confused and I couldn't trust my instincts anymore of like what's irrational versus what which is, which is rational. Um, so there was like a year and a half of me just like, I don't know who to listen to, so I'm just gonna stay in. And then and that gets reinforced and reinforced and reinforced. Mm -hmm. And it was fine for a little bit because everyone was supposed to do this. We were told. But it's confusing when CDC is telling me one thing, my family and friends are telling me another thing, my, the kid in me is telling me something else, and then what would make me the happiest is saying this, and I don't fucking know. So right. let's just do let's just do a lot of edits on the podcast just to, to, to distract yeah, so yourself. Yeah, the, so the podcast was, was it's perfect because people come over and they sit on the Dude. towel and they take their shoes off and they wash their hands and they're in... They're in that one space, and yeah. when they're done, they go from the one space outside. So during the pandemic, uh, it, it really was beneficial because we didn't have stand-up, and I needed an outlet, and I put so much into this podcast. I do a lot of editing, a lot of editing. It's a full-time job. And during the pandemic, I, I would be in my living room, and I'd have my guests come over, uh, and they were outside. I have a balcony, and they're outside, but with a glass door. And they have headphones so we could hear each other. And it was this novelty of like, oh, it's funny. Somebody's out on the patio with cars driving by. But it was also, it let me talk to people. Right. And uh, I'm very grateful for it, it, my podcast built during this time. And I had all this time and energy put into it. But I've gotten used to people catering to my neuroses. But, uh, uh, if they didn't cater to your neuroses, would it make you better or would it make you worse? I think there's an equilibrium that I'm, I'm conscious of now that I want to I wanna understand better and work toward. It was great because, I mean, otherwise, you can't, I mean, also all other people didn't want to come over. I gave them a safe space. We both felt safe and that's great. But at a certain point, this is life now, you know, and, and I was nervous doing this because we're so close. I still am not this close to people, but this is what life is now. Right. So, if if you guys said, oh, it's okay, we'll change the cameras, and we'll, at a certain point, I don't want to work with Rick. It's just too much work to deal with all of his stuff. Right. I don't want to be that. Does that does that make sense? Yeah. So when you're editing that much, what are you editing out? Is it, is is your OCD going to the editing as well? Yeah. You put um, some things in, you take them out, you put them back in. Mm, yeah. Also, I want to. I have a little bit of a team now that helps me with this stuff, and it's it's so great. But I do a lot of edits where they're not just. Um, it's not just pacing edits. I do a lot of zoom ins. We do live action animation. I do a lot of bits to where we snap and it will cut to uh, I'm on America's Got Talent and we do jokes with with all the guests and we dub their voices and little sketches and you know you know what I mean and, and like I'll start the podcast. You know we were setting up cameras and stuff. I'll have the cameras rolling while we're doing that. So there's a half hour before the podcast yeah. that I'll chop up to like two minutes to show here's how George and I actually met. You know, and like, uh, don't touch me. Oh, sorry about this. Nice to meet you. Oh, you cool. killed somebody, huh? Oh, you saved somebody, huh? And just that. Yeah. And uh, yes. it's like making a little movie every week. Wow. I make a movie every week because I didn't have stand-up. How'd you do the animation? Uh, shout out to Tom Bates, uh, a guy in England who I never met. I, t I always wanted animation. I did an episode where I said, I don't have a budget for this, but then I did some stuff. He animated it for me. And it was like, this is incredible. And then we got to talking, and now we work together. And the computer, he did it by, by computer. In England, I send him the stuff. Every wow. week, we do notes. And uh, he's... He's amazing. He's, he's, he's incredible. And, and every episode, I've, it's, it's awesome. I mean, it's I mean, a cartoon. I animation, man. Like, Warner Brothers did it, Disney back then. A, a civilian doing it? A guy that you're here, and he's in England, and then you send him the stuff, and you go over notes, and it's you're great. creating this animation? It's pretty amazing it's, awesome. it's also i feel like I've, I've captured this market on my podcast where i i i put in more i put in a lot on the podcast because for a year and a half is all i had and uh yeah i'm just really proud of my podcast no good and what kind of guests and what kind of guests do you do you, do you have 
I mean, are they all friends of yours or people you haven't no, met? No, a lot of people I haven't met. I've been fortunate enough to have people who, uh, are, um, like, I look up to on the podcast. Um, directors, athletes, comedians, musicians. Uh, I get really cool guests. And um, it's not specifically entertainment, but because of the business we're in, that's usually how well, it works. Isn't, yeah. isn't anything that you can watch entertainment? Yeah, yeah, but I'm saying a lot of podcasts have, like, because I do talk a lot about mental health and psychology and stuff, but I don't have like therapists on and, and professionals in that world, which I, I was thinking about getting into, but then there's gonna be little cartoon dicks running around with these professionals and I don't know how much they'll yeah, into no. it. So, so, so let's say this because, you know, I think with the homeless population in Los Angeles and everything that's going on in the country that a lot of them are mentally ill. Mm -hmm. And then I guess at some point, maybe some become criminal because if you're, if you're starving, you're hungry, you're, you're, you're a person, you, you become, you're gonna try to- Squid games. Get something, yeah, you're gonna exactly. try to get something to, to eat and stuff, but there's a but there's more now, and where I would have seen somebody dancing, like I saw someone at an old Pier One in, Pier One Imports on on Sunset, and they were dancing, where I would have thought it was funny. I don't think it's funny anymore. What do you mean? To see oh, you saying you th to, thought it was funny because now you realize that they might be mentally yeah. unwell. Yeah, and I mean I grew up here, but I when I see somebody out there in the street, they're talking to themselves, or you know they're young and they look like it's just not sad. Yeah. Yeah, it's sad. I mean, well, listen, we, we're Mexican. We laugh at everybody. But I should do it. I should start playing Mexican rooms then. I think so. There's one in <laughs> Bellflower you should go to. It's, uh, it's sad, but I still laugh. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, you, you see them out. They're out there 24 hours a day. Like, I mean, that's their, their world, man. I, it feels bad that we haven't done more for people who are mentally ill. Well, why don't we put all the proceeds of this episode? All right. Into uh, my animation budget. I like <laughs> I'd, like to, I'd like to see. I'd like to see one of your animation things. Listen, no obligations. We'll talk about it later. I'd love to have you on. All right, great. Yeah, yeah. We'll figure it out. And how, and how is your mom? Is your mom? Um, does she still have the OCD? Yeah. And her father, my grandpa, was ah, was uh, he was a, a very successful uh, mu musician. Um, he arranged and produced all of Ray Charles's music oh. after 1959. All of it, but some stuff. A lot of people, but that is the stuff. And he was his conductor and. He would uh, he would write his on the plane. Would we know him, uh, Sid Feller? I don't think you know would know the name, but I mean. So on a plane, he could just on a plane. He would he would arrange entire orchestras. He did all, he did uh, Georgia and all the strings he did without even not even at a piano, just like in his head, Fuck. doing this. Yeah. And uh, it's uh, I've learned a bit about autism, and it wasn't you know that well understood before 1993. But he was autistic without a doubt, and he was uh, brilliant. But he. He, I remember uh, his relationship with my grandma was so. Is this okay? To talk? Is this boring? Yeah, I'm talking yeah, to my grandparents no, no, with you no, guys. Yeah. Is it boring? Oh, no. Um, no, fascinating. Uh, the relationship that my grandfather, uh, grandpa, and, and grandma Gert had was is, is so beautiful, but cute and funny because she was so the opposite. And my grandpa used to, and very similar to my grandpa, but he used to. He would make a cereal and he would cut a banana, and you, all the pieces would be the same size, and you would place them in the spiral. I mean, it would take him realistically yeah. four minutes to plate the bananas, which is a long time to put bananas on a bowl of cereal, <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. and then he would do it for her. So, you know, it's a while. And then he would eat, and everything would be the exact bite, but she would just mix it up and not wow. care. And my mom asked her, why does, um, and this, why do uh, you let him do that? And she said, uh, uh, it makes him feel good. And I think there's something, I mean, it's so simple, but it's something so sweet about that because I grew up where a lot of my things um, were weird, uh, and it made me feel good. Yeah, you know, I didn't want it. It sucks that that's what I need to do. But at the time in my life, that's what I had to do. And to have somebody who is just just accepting of it, not trying to fix it, not complaining about it. Um, that's it, beautiful. It's not it, harming anybody. Do it. But a lot of people would be like, what the fuck are you doing? Don't do that or hurry up and give it to me. But I think that's that's mm -hmm. almost fucking torture to somebody. Yeah, you're trying to get it. This probably won't make it. You're trying to get somebody to close the door. And every time you see the fucking door open, you say to yourself, but you can't close that fucking door, right? And all the things that happen because that fucking door is open, and if you close it and you come back five minutes later, it's going to be open. And you're asking somebody, can you close this door in his house? Is this a thing that happens with your door a lot? Is that why you're saying yeah, that? Yeah, somebody, this ain't going to be on. Has, oh. it, you know, your daughter, right? So his daughter living with him, and no, 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 cur no is it courtesy? No. Respect? Consideration? No consideration for 
what he want what he wants in his house. Yeah. You know, the cat the, the cat fucking dog eats the cat food and the be better if the door was closed. Doors never closed. But also like you are saying with the cutting the bananas, if if I if you're O C D and you're a young kid and you're back like back in the day or whatever and you put your jacket in a certain thing and they tell your mom says I fuck and she grabs a jacket and she throws it on the ground and she goes I fucking hate that you put your jacket there inside you're 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 going fucking crazy in your head especially as a kid where you don't know your own boundaries yet Mm -hmm. and then you start to adapt other people's and you judge yourself and Mm -hmm. I I grew up very fortunate with understanding parents yeah and I didn't know if it was you know um, generational OCD or those things but as Wait, a compo- as a composer generational what do you mean uh, like people like having genetic, it or diagnosed um, diagnosed or like genetic like sort genetic. of passed it's down it's genetic yeah, yeah. there's a big genetic factor yeah in genetic it. yeah so so a, a guy who's a uh, composer who sees the thing in their head is like a beautiful mind like you just you see the notes and you you can hear them without yeah. the actual music and you're sitting mm-hmm. there and you're writing on a plane and you you're doing your work isn't that so cool Orchestras, Absolutely. yeah, no in- instruments, awesome. different things, just, just like this. I mean, that's like Mozart. Like I that's can't imagine Beethoven. what it, what it's like, you know, just n- doing for orchestras. Yeah, uh, and not having anything to even hear, just knowing the notes. Yeah, so cool. Yeah, um, but uh, uh, did your did your mom work? Yeah, she sells perfume, uh, but she was, uh, uh, you know, I guess relatively speaking, a stay at home mother. Mm-hmm. Um, and she has some OCD too, but my grandfather and, and I have it. It's, my mom is like, you know, she'll turn all these things to face the right way. But all of her things serve a purpose. She's very organized. She gets things done. She has checklists, you know. All of her things are logical where I'm more just like, could you move your glasses a little bit? Yeah. You know, why? If, some, if someone doesn't understand what that is and you're in a relationship with somebody, it, it, it's, it can be fucking hell to live with somebody. So somebody I know, um, when they were growing up, the mother was OCD, and when the dog would go outside and come in, she would clean the dog's paws with like Lysol, like a rag and spray the Lysol and clean the dog's feet coming into the house and cleaning where everybody, where everybody stepped. And it was a thing where he said, you know, if, you, if we went in the kitchen and we made toast and we thought we cleaned, she'd spend an hour picking up every yeah. fucking crumb or, or the knife that you left butter on and the, I mean, and it, it could be mad. exhausting for both people. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I'm in a relationship. Um, shout out to Betty. We'll put her Instagram handle up here where, uh, <laughs> she is, uh, very, uh, I have never met somebody <clears throat> who not only is okay with the thing I'm doing, she thinks it's funny, you know? So kind of like, not only does but my thing is funny, but it's, uh, she, no, she, she understands it. She understands, but, but it also funny. thinks it's funny. Like, if because I'll sometimes be like, I, I can't have like I'll have these little like, and and instead of her being like whoa or just being submissive, she'll like almost making fun of me in a way like she knows like relax, dude, you yeah. know yeah. Um, she uh, for some reason likes to just make sure that her fingers are sticky before she touches stuff. It makes her feel better, I guess. She just <laughs> touches stuff and then she'll open all the handles. And there's little sticky stuff on the stuff. <laughs> and uh, she's, you know, I know it's a very cliche thing that, you know, your girl, she's not hungry, but then she wants some of your food. That wouldn't bother me, but she wants, <laughs> yeah. I'll leave my salad in and she'll eat the, the beans and the corns out of it. So I just have lettuce left. And I get upset with her. And instead of, she puts notes up on the, on the refrigerator, don't eat Ricky's food or he'll yell at you. And like, now my friends see this. And like, she kind of busts my balls about it in a way where it kind of calms me down. Oh, you, you know, uh, no, no, yeah, I, I, I get it, I get it, because she, it's a, it, because it's almost well. What is it through humor? You identify something, and if you can make it funny, then you get to see their perspective. Yeah, you know, a lot of the traits that he's talking about, and with his mannerisms, I don't know if you can see him behind your behind your dad's back, but does the thing that the doctor does when he gets excited. Hey, it, you know, the way he moves his hand, the way he talks, little things, the very same thing you're talking about. Are you saying he's doing he, the doctor's material? He does that stuff on the show. Stealing material. You're saying he's stealing from the doctor. He's stealing. He's from stealing the from the writers. Do, doc, do, do, which doctor? Uh, the good doctor. The good doctor. Yeah. The good doctor. The. Uh, oh, I thought you meant like another comic. I'm like, am I doing his material? No, 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 no. Am no, I no, doing no. doctor? Doctor. Uh, no. You're doing Drew's little doctor. Oz. You're doing little doctor Oz. He's a prop doctor. Like a good doctor. This is uh, the program. The good doctor. He's an autistic doctor. Did you know that? 
What? That the good doctor was an autistic doctor? Yeah. I didn't know that. I don't, I, 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 uh, I do know that. The actor is not autistic. No, he's not. But I understand after he plays his roles, boy, are his arms tired. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, but when you do that, is there tension in your arms or are you relaxed? I, I, I think this is just a, some people are, talk with their hands, you know? Yeah. Yeah. You, sometimes you do this. You know what I mean? How, how, now, how does a guy that's, that's that way, you know, not only that way in the bad, but find stand up? Are you musical? Oh, yeah. Play the piano? Yeah. Why did I say piano? Because I think... You knew piano, you knew older brother, Yeah. but you thought I was under 30. Yes. So. Miss. Did you just call me Miss? I Miss. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> two, I you're two for four. That's another one. I Miss. I Miss. I miss. <laughs> Sorry no, about that, but, Miss. But, but uh, yeah, how do you find that way? Because now you're in a room of people and then you're standing... So, you're, you're so uh, I loved comedy. Um, I loved... Uh, creating stuff like even in college i would whenever there was uh, i was a marketing uh, major marketing and theater but for all business stuff i would always do make videos and like yeah. try to make content and stuff and um i wanted to be an actor i didn't even know comedy necessarily but i wanted to act and create stuff and i went i saw tracy morgan at the hollywood improv not the hollywood improv the cleveland improv mm -hmm. and i was a fan of tracy morgan but i'd never seen his stand-up and i i was blown away that you know, SNL Tracy Morgan is not no. this state. And it was weird. It was like, it was in, like, it was curious to me. And it kind of got me very curious about stand up. of, I can't, I, I can make something up, but that's, that's the nugget of it. Right. Uh, where I want to try this. So it's just, I, I wanted to try it because as you know, it's easier to get up on stage than in front of a camera. Um, there's no production. You know, you just go up. Yeah, you you do an open, I could go up tonight in one yeah. place. Um, so I took a class at the Hollywood Improv. It was four weekends, uh, and then the fourth weekend. Well, what was happening in the class? Just you know, I, I don't, I don't they, know. Because you know, the, across street from the Comedy Store, there used to be the Annex. So the Comedy Store Annex, like in the early '80s, '70s, and on Sundays you could go in there, and I think it was like a dollar, and you'd go in there, and it'd be Danny Mora and like Robert Aguayo and some guys that were regulars at the store, but mostly they were like young comedians, and then you'd go up there. And you would uh, maybe do five minutes, and then mm -hmm. they would critique you. So I don't know if it was a, a class other than they probably say, you know, you you're doing this or you're doing that. I think you should try this. You're talking too fast. You, you know. Yeah, I don't. It was t 2007, um, but like that's uh, you know, move the microphone, stand out of the way. Right. When they're talking, it would be, uh, you know, well, how do you make this more personal? Do you stuff that that like. I guess I'm sure it's good advice, but it's not going to be enough. You know, it's just, right. but what it was for me, and I would imagine a lot of people, and um, that's why I don't not, when people like taking a comedy class and some people like, you're not going to learn anything. It's not just about learning something. It's about being put in a position where you're forced to get over a fear or do it anyway. So it forced us all this community of people that nobody wanted to do it because it's terrifying. Right. So it just basically, what that class gave me was it forced me to do my first set um, in front of an audience that was there to be supportive. Uh, and then it was like, yeah, I like this. Uh, yeah. Um, and I moved here. You know what? That, that's, a, that's a good point. But, you know, somebody, an audience that was there to be, to be uh, um, supportive as opposed to just going in cold and yeah. on a Monday and yeah. you sign up and the guy's like, hey, you know, oh, I haven't done it before. I'm going to see how it goes. And that, that's fucking got to be scary. I bet there's pros and cons to both. I mean, experiencing that big bomb that first time, I mean, get it out of the way, I guess. Because when I first went up, I, I still haven't done a set that good. <laughs> you know, they were all just like, you know, good for him. It's his first time. My son's going up next or whatever, or my yeah. brother. Um, so there was a little bit of a false confidence. You think in a, it is? In a good way. In a, in a good way. It's just, a good, it's just, yeah, it was just like, this ain't so bad. It was. I didn't know it yet. But, you know, this ain't so hard. <laughs> um, but it is hard. I remember a uh, the guy there, Lee, his name is, uh, Lee Herlins. He ran the improv in Cleveland for a long time. Maybe still does. I don't know. But I remember afterwards he said to me, uh, it's going to take you 10 years to be uh, a, uh, a headlining comedian. And I remember thinking, thinking then, I believe that's the case for people, but there's no way 10 years. There's no, and, and I think I've always remembered that. And yeah, it, ta it takes everybody. It's almost like it takes everybody 10 years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I started when I was 22, I guess. So like when people start when they're older. The, what, what are we learning along the way as we're like when you start from zero and you're up there and you go up there and maybe you do good one time and, you, and there's no, 
I mean, you haven't done it enough to, to have consistency. So you're right. like, oh, that was good. Your friends, yeah, that was good. Next time it's not so good. And you're like, ah, fuck, I didn't do so well. That you don't live and die with every time you go up. It's just trying to get a little bit of your legs under you. Yeah. Uh, trying to be able to, to kind of uh, not take too much time, but yet not talk too fast. I mean, there's so many things. How old were you when you started? 18. I was still in high school. When, when, because it was a, it was a, it was obviously a different time. There were less people doing it then. How long until you were making a living? Um, well, you know, I would, you know, oh, fuck, man, I was like a quitter. So I would start and stop, you know, <laughs> and, uh, I would go for a little bit one year and then not go for a few stop months for a and then go back. And I just couldn't commit to it. So Why? I, I, you know, my, I got diagnosed by my baseball coach in high school that whenever something became tough for me, I would quit. And it was right. Was that a conscious thing? You know, this no. is hard. I don't want to do it. No, I just realized I didn't really have an, uh, any true desire. I didn't have a father. You know, they didn't, nobody really taught me that when shit gets tough, that's when you dig in more. I would quit. Why did you go back and stay? And how old were you? Uh, I was uh, 18, 24. And it done, I was playing golf. And golf is, is tough. I love it. I still play and when I started to play golf in the beginning, if I hit it sideways, I would leave after nine holes. So the guy's like, where are you going? Oh, man, I got to meet somebody. I forgot. But I was quitting. They and didn't have cell phones when you were 24. No. Yeah. That one like that? Yeah. Oh, so, yeah. <laughs> you know, so I, didn't have these, I didn't have these fingers when I was. You know. so, so I was in the car after one time I left, and I could almost, see, you know, like in Star Wars, you see that. I could see my coach. And he was like, hey, when shit gets tough, you quit. And fucking man, I never done. I never, I never connected the two things. And I connected it to all the stuff that I love to do and didn't do anymore because it got tough. And I just kind of, it just kind of all became clear there. What did you decide to start doing again other than stand up? Did you go play the back nine? I would play all eighteen holes. I wouldn't quit if it got tough. And then I went back to my high school. My coach was still there. <clears throat> He's passed since then. But I went and apologized to him, and he was like, he couldn't believe that I went to tell him that I was sorry for the way I acted. And I thanked him for his for his diagnosis of me, and it changed my it changed my the rest of my life. You started stand up six years later. You're off and on. You make this realization. You're 24 now. You lean in, mm -hmm. and then when do you make a living from it? 87. How old are you then? Um, 27. So it took you three years of after six years of off and on. It took you three years to make a living. And it took me seven years to do the Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. It took you so you were thirty-one. Mm -hmm. uh, you're doing an hour, three years in on the road, or is that not how it worked then? No, you were doing spots, uh, but yeah, an hour. Yeah, an hour. How old are you when you got your show? Minutes. Your first one. I was uh, forty-two. That's cool, man. But in increments, it, it, you know, if you look at it, if I look at it now, looking back in increments, I had a pretty good. Incrementally, I had pretty good, pretty good success, and I had a radio show in Los Angeles here in 2000. And um, you know, I mean, you know, somebody could see you and help you, but they can't do the jokes for you. So you know, I met Sandra Bullock in 2000, and she was like, you know, I like what you do. I, you know, you got to come over to the office and you know, let's talk and see if there's a, you know a show here. And I wasn't gonna go. And I was like, ah, oh, fuck, man. Sandra Bullock produced your show? Mm-hmm. The Sandra Bullock, the actress? Mm -hmm. she Small world. Me. She found me. Too, uh, <laughs> she found me, man. I mean, she, fuck, I don't know. I'd be sitting here. I cut you off, though. Keep saying no, what no. you're saying. You went so, to her office. So, so you know, you went to her office, and I don't think I ever had really anybody that had my my back that was, that had, that could help somebody, you know. Had the confidence in you. And had the confidence in me that. Where'd she see you? She saw me at the, that brilliant the Bray Improv. Oh. At one live show she happened to have been at. No, we set it up for her to go. But she drove from the fucking Chateau Marmont to Brea to see me on a Thursday. And I was headlining the week. Oh, Shout out to Sandra Bullock. We'll put her Instagram yeah, right here. Yeah, I put her Instagram. Uh, I have her email too. We, put and, and, um, <laughs> we won't put that in. <laughs> and she, she was like, I, I want to see more. And, you know, her mother had passed in that time. And she had done Miss Congeniality and became like very disillusioned with Hollywood because you knew somebody, your mom, and she was a little bit lost. And the, the success of Hollywood is not the same as, you know, you, you lose your mother. She says, I didn't want to act. And then when she saw me, she said that she saw somebody that was happy for just even the most, 
little bit of things going forward. Like, I mean, she goes, you, you reignited m the thing in me that, that made me want to be an actress was that you were so happy about just the, the, the smallest thing going your way. And she said, I had to see where that would go. What set were you doing where you were talking about gratitude like that? Um, I wasn't. I was just doing stuff about growing up. And she saw you uh, being grateful in it, like a subtext? No, no, no. She saw the, the kind of like the, the, the whole relationship with the mom and relationship with the grandmother, relationship. And, but you're saying and, she saw you being happy about little things. Oh, it, it, as we started to work together. Gotcha. Why did she come see you? What was it that like? You know, she, she had a partner, this guy, Jonathan, that would go out and they were trying to do shows, trying to produce shows. Right. And she tried to produce a couple of shows and it didn't work. So when she took a break from acting, she thought, well, maybe I'll try to find somebody and produce a show. And the two, the, you know, the two things that she had done didn't work. And she saw me and it worked. And then with her going to all the tapings and being, you know, if she was in New York and we were casting, you know, we, we'd feed her in and she'd see or she'd feed her, we'd feed her in. Was on she the, ever on the show? Yeah. And she was on the show. Uh, how far? Which is, which is pretty crazy, man, because that it's like that one person that doesn't know you, doesn't, but she sees what you are and sees the joy in somebody and says, I, 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 I got to do this. And it, cha and it changed her. It changed us. That was the story. Bill Lawrence came to the improv to see Brent, my friend Brent, mm -hmm. but I was on the show too. And that was the same story. He, he gave me my first job and it was just some guy that champions you for some reason. Um, it wasn't even the greatest set in the world. It was actually a very weird set. Uh, and he came up to me and he said, I love how comfortable you are in uncomfortable moments. And I remember thinking, I love that he appreciated me, but, I, but what was uncomfortable? <laughs> you, know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. you know, like this was funny. It was, I did it on purpose. Um, but yeah, it just takes one champion who has an ability to help you and, and then decide to help you. Right. And in the way that you prepared your material, was, was it a lot of putting things in and out? Or did you commit to something, or did you? I I used to. I still do, but I'm I'm trying to fix it. Uh, I used to. Um, I have a problem lying. Um, <laughs> I have a problem lying uh, yeah. for a lot of reasons. Uh, mostly, it just it's too hard to keep track of. And sometimes I do things that feel like a lie, even if they're not. I've talked about it on my podcast a lot, but the how was your weekend? Good. How was your like? Just I'm lying to, about my interest of yours. I'm lying about telling you good if it was. It just makes me uncomfortable, so I, I try to avoid that. But isn't that what the, just the way that people, unfortunately, greet each other? And it's like, have a good day. Yeah, have a good day's fine. Yeah, thanks. Uh, uh, but yeah, what, thanks. hey, how was what, what how was uh, how was your quarantine? Yeah, it's like, what do you want me to tell you, man? Do I have right. to get put a, do an act. Yeah, I don't know. It was sucked. Yeah, it's awful. But I don't want to. It just feels disingenuous. It feels right. It, mm -hmm. It's not, and it's not small talk. It's disingenuous. It depends on everyone has their own intentions. They all want to connect in the ways they do, but. Can you tell when someone's lying? Yes. yes. What do they do? Is it in your training and police training? Look up and to yes. the left. Yes, up to the left, whether it's lying or recalling. They yeah. do? Uh, fabric, yeah, when you're accessing, fabricating. when you're trying to make something up, or you're accessing something that is, but if you're recalling a memory, it's up and to the right. It depends if you're right hand or left hand. It works just the opposite for either hand. Wow. Is that an all humans? What the fuck is that? Hey, ask 90, me that again. Ask 99. me that again. <laughs> is that an all humans? 54%. <laughs> Tell we'll be right back after a word. 99%. 99% of, <laughs> of the people are the same way. Uh, wow, man. That's recalling, fabricating. It's total who recalling. Who created, who created the, the lie detector test? Is James it it, it, <laughs> <laughs> Frenchman. <laughs> because that, that, again, is like uh, when you're uncomfortable, your body might heat up or, you know, this fucking hand, you know. And you're like, I got, you know. Kinesics indicative of deception. It. Right. That's what it's called. What did you say? Kinesics indicative of deception. Yeah. Things CID, phys KID. Physiological changes your body goes through that you have no control over just does it. Ramirez was a, was a finger tapper. And when you take his anxiety level up, it's like the horse races are gone. Wow. Some people are toe tappers. Some people yawn. Some people, you know, just uh, stretch. Drive him out. Tell me about that time you were fucking with him about his growing up and he started to. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, he started. He, we were talking to him. Who's him? Uh, Richard uh, Ramirez, night. serial killer. Night stalker. And talking Should to him. Should get him on the pod. About, <laughs> I would, but we'd have to resurrect him. He's dead. I'm, I'm sorry. No, don't be sorry. <laughs> oh, I don't know. Okay. I would you know, you know how, how much people hated him? He died and he served 20 years in prison. And the people were like, he didn't fucking do enough time. Yeah, yeah, he's he fucking dead. <laughs> he died. Uh, but we started talking Got about his, his sister. 
and the relationship between his sister and his dad, and I start raising his anxiety level. He started getting upset. He had his head, head down on the table, his fists were like this, and all of a sudden he starts sucking in air almost to the point of hyperventilation. And he's, <laughs> his hands started coming up. So for a millisecond there, I was concerned this guy was going to start levitating because he was he was into Satanism. And then I realized, no, no, he's just human. He'll, he'll right. be fine. So, but he but, couldn't deal with it. No, he couldn't deal with it. It was, but I was pushing his buttons too. I, I'll tell you this: if this was on my podcast, we're animating. He's levitating, and I'm going to say, "Hold on one <laughs> second. Right, I'm going to, I'm going to, and then I'm going to get a reaction shot of me going, and then be like, "All right, I'm sorry." So, so your sister. <laughs> <laughs> we went from that to, "Hey, you want to take a break? You want something to eat? Let's yeah. And we got him some food. Is that, and why do and why do police? Uh, Take somebody to like McDonald's after they arrest them. Gain trust. Come on, dude. What do you know? Well, yeah. we, it doesn't matter where you're at. Whatever they want. Sorry. Whatever they want. Kidding. I took a killer. Uh, <laughs> get them. I've taken them to get burritos. They're Mexican. I ain't gonna get them a hamburger. Right? Yeah. <laughs> because you're building. You're. You're just you're building a, a little rapport. Guy. Yeah. Let's see. Treat a guy like you'd like to be treated if you were in his shoes. Don't take much. Doesn't mean I love him. I'm gonna take him out to dinner later on. He's just. And it's good. Good cop. Bad cop. Uh. uh a procedure in police work? Only with the guy goes like, fuck him. So anyways. Um, that only works with new guys that haven't been involved in law. You yeah. Know, that haven't been involved in the law. Who, yeah. What would you play? Good I'd or bad? I'd play good cop. Can we do it? Can we do a little good cop, bad cop with him? Yeah. All right. That's a nice hat you're wearing. It's not a nice hat. It's a fucking trash hat. What'd you do last night? Don't listen to him. What does it look? You think I'm going to answer your fucking question? You see a pee on my forehead? I ain't no pen there. Yeah, I can't do this. I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah. I'm, maybe I, I'm sorry. I'm, I'll be good cop, too. Because he knows if he touches you, you're, you're going to fucking run off. Yeah? Like in the <laughs> cartoons, you run through the wall and your, <laughs> your shape will be through. That's good merch. <laughs> <laughs> People always doing the silhouette of their face. Just do it. Run into the wall. Through a mountain, a uh, uh, hole in a mountain for a train tracks. Whatever. You get it. Coyote. <laughs> Violet Coyote. Uh, um, but I was talking about that because I, I had this thing where when I I always assume that the audience has seen me before, um, not not just that's just the the, your, the, your the process. The, so by that they've seen this already. So when I'm doing it again, I'm lying. Um, ah. Now that's not what the craft is. You have to master something, and it's okay to do, try things again. But I would always be uncomfortable because a lot of a lot of devices and storytelling is recalling stuff as if you're just recalling it, and I'm not just recalling it. This was all planned. And the right. fact that they know that I'm no longer a step ahead of them, which I always find that if I'm not in the audience with them, then it's hard for me to be present. Does that make sense? Like, if I know everything I'm going to say, then I'm just, I'm not really having these memories. Right. Do you do everything the same every time? No. So what I used to do is just constantly be doing new stuff, writing new th new things constantly, 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 constantly. And that was cool because I got good at writing stuff mm -hmm. and trying new stuff, but I was never curating. I, I think of, um, I said this on my podcast once, I had this realization and I kind of, there's only so many jokes in the world and they all exist. It's just if you could see them. Right. Right. So there's a moment that you're on and, and I look at jokes like bricks and like, yeah. oh, got one and, and you take them and I would find these bricks so much that. Huh? Huh? And then you know you 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 just know that true. It's almost like when you're making money and you feel like you don't need to save it. But the the art is taking well these said. bricks and building a foundation on something. And it, it was the first eight years I wasn't doing that. I got great at writing bits. I bad at structuring them. So it was only the past few years that I started doing that. For the stuff. first eight years, where you were just trying to find the. I was playing. Yeah. Very experimental. Oh. Lots of weird stuff. A lot of character stuff. Um, the, 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 the set that Bill came to at the, oh, I'm yeah. sorry, go ahead. No, go, go ahead. Um, it was, uh, me, uh, it was just an eight minute set and I did the, uh, a drawn out monologue of fresh, I did my uh, Will Smith impression and I turn around and I get into character for way too long. So it's like two minutes of silence <laughs> and I turn back and I do the monologue of when his father left and I got to tell you something, destroyed it, crying in beautiful, not an impression of Will, but a performance of that scene. And that was the, well, that's not funny. There's no setup to it. It was just, but in the middle of an ad, in the middle of a set where who's this guy? He does a six minute impression right. of Will Smith. That kind of stuff. I'm not going to ever do that again. But something about in the moment, I'm going on stage. I just rewatched that scene. I know the words. Like I want to do Will Smith today. There's nothing to build. You know what I mean? It's just being silly. 
So I, the first eight years was me practicing, performing, committing, not being affected by it's the audience, bit, bit, not liking me. It's a bit me. of theater, yeah, yeah. You had theater background. Yeah, yeah. Is that in the Is that in the Fresh Prince? The, the scene where, it, it, yeah, where no, his father. I don't think I've ever seen it. Oh, iconic! It's it makes one me of, cry every time. No shit. You know mm-hmm. what? I'm gonna send you a performance of me doing it. I bet you you'll cry, and then you'll watch the Will one. Wow. We'll put up a clip. Yeah, I have one. Yeah, if you got, I'll yeah, send it to you. Got we'll, the put we'll put it. Why should I be mad? At least say goodbye this time. I'm just mad. I, I wasted my money buying this stupid present. Hey, you know what? It, 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 there's nothing to do, you know? It's it, not like I'm five years old, waiting up every night, asking mom, when's dad coming home? Who needs him? Hey, he wasn't there to teach me how to shoot my first hoop, but I learned, didn't I? <laughs> Got pretty damn good, too, didn't I, Uncle Phil? Yes. Got through my first date without him. I learned how to drive without him. I had 14 birthdays. He never even sent me a car to hell with him. You know what, Uncle Phil? I'm gonna get through college without him. I'm gonna get me a great job without him. I'm gonna marry me a beautiful honey and I'm gonna have me a whole bunch of kids and I'm a better father than he ever could be. There ain't a damn thing he can teach me about how to love my kids. How come you don't want me, man? How come you don't want me? Mr. Rickers. Mr. Rickers. You... <laughs> I thought you were, sa- you were sad, real sad. <laughs> I oh. my, my heart hurt for that. <laughs> that was incredible. That was episode 100 of Take Your but Shoes would you, Off. But, but would you produce someone else's podcast or you can, only do, you can only care that much about yourself? My girlfriend has been helping me produce mine. Um, and we, we have this idea of we want to do that. But I mean, it, I'm, I'm so in the weeds on mine, it would be hard. But uh, it would be nice if I get to the point where I could hire more people and still be a producer and manage this. But... If you hire more people, would you micromanage them or would you trust that? Yeah. Well, I would have to at first. What I'm so grateful for now, which has taken so long, is I have a couple of guys that help. Where. (laughs) Now he's just. It's so many. He's just fast. We. uh, uh, (laughs) You you find people that. They're not better. There are so many people that we. That you. That everyone works with. They're not better or worse. They're just different and they don't necessarily work in your voice. Is it jazz? Is is, is it it jazzy? It's jazzy for me in the moment, not in post. I have rules in post. Okay. We play here, but then in post, you know, we're levitating, we're doing whatever. But then in post, there's certain formats and things that I want people to do. I'm getting a little insecure talking about this now. I feel this is what did you aspire when you started? Okay. What did you aspire to do? What, what was what was a big thing for you? The I want to direct. Special? Direct. You want to direct. I want to. I want to create stuff. And to me, it was always the vision of directing stuff. I want to be in it. I think you'd be a good director. Thank you. Because I think you'd see everything. Closer to the mic. I think no. No, I'm I think, still I think you're fine. <laughs> but I think that you would. I think that you would see everything like, almost like your, your grandfather did, like in his in your in your head, and in when you show up, even though you show up and they're like, "Is this guy prepared?" You have it in your head. That's why my podcast. My podcast has been great practice for that. Yeah. And I've been doing it. I've been learning how to talk to tons of different people, some that I know well, some that I don't know, to get this thing that I like. And I found this team of people that understand the way I want to do it, plus they have their own things they add to it. So what I've been able to do the past few months, maybe even more than, is not micromanage as much, it's, which is the goal. It's tough. Mm-hmm. But you have to find somebody, you, you have to find people you trust. And it, there's so, everybody has different intuition. It's hard to find and also, people. And also, you know, now because there's so many more things to do, you, you don't know if you find somebody and you guys connect that that person wouldn't leave to do something else. Like in, back totally. in the day, you, 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 since there were less things to do, if you had somebody that you worked with, more likely they would stay with you, especially if you got along, then they would stay with you. But now if you um, have somebody with you and you're great and you have the whole vibe, that they leave because they either want to do their own thing or you know, they're not that connected to you as much as you're connected to them. I've made a point, and I, I, I over-communicate it, um, but I feel it's better than the opposite of checking in with the people that I work with all the time and letting them know because I was losing money for a while and then I was breaking even and now making a little bit of money but I, 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 my budget I have a lot of people I'm paying who are the sponsors for your podcast uh, Manscaped no I don't have man, I used to have Manscaped um, I mean it's you fun. guys get, get them from me ATC gets them from me I mean BetterHelp Helix Mattress Did you, do you think BetterHelp is good 
Yes. Uh, my, my friend of mine is a therapist. My best childhood friend is a therapist. And um, I was talking about it because before I work with sponsors, I, I want to either been using them or like them and right. find out about them. And, and I asked him, and at first he told me honestly that he wasn't sure um, he is in person and that's the way he likes to do things. And uh, he had nothing bad to say. But that's the way he likes to do things. Not but, maybe but necessarily. But since then, yeah. he has been hearing more about it and looking into it and has said, you know, I really think I want to be a part of this now. And he wants to maybe be a therapist with them in addition to his practice. Have you, have you, um, have you ever had therapy? No. Do you think you would benefit from therapy? I, th- I think you would cry in the first 10 minutes of therapy. <laughs> <laughs> I'd cry first 10 or minutes. Or like Bobby Lee, maybe you would shit. One of the no, two. No, no, no. I ain't going to be like Bobby Lee. I'll cry, but I ain't going to shit. But he, he, I, he, I've he, never. Cut uh, to a clip of you in therapy yeah. just shitting and crying. You know, I. Can we, sh- can uh, we animate Bobby Lee shitting on himself? I th- done do it. it. Do it. I have, a, I have an episode uh, with Kalila on uh, where Bobby comes over and shits on her shoulder. <laughs> Little animated Bobby. <laughs> You know that shit. That's, it costs you know it's so much time, but nobody <laughs> could find that that amazing shit joke. Oh yeah, I mean a shit joke is they're they're all jokes. You know, hey, I'm just part of the same I shit jokes and props. They work. They work. I was collaborating with a psycho- departmental psychologist. We were going to do some team teaching for the department. We did that, and I told her at the end, I, you know, now we're done. What we're doing here, I said, I got a question for you, and I started talking about personal problems. So therapy. And she said, "You know what? We need to schedule you to come back and talk to me on your, you know, on your own." You didn't go. So no, I did. I went to her twice, and by the third time, she says, "Okay, you're headed for divorce. All you have to do is admit it, and get ready for it, make the separation." That's what she said. And here we are. I never went back. So here I am, married fifty years plus, and. She's no longer in the department. She was, uh, I did a. They was said, that a false uh, diagnosis? I, I think it was. I, 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 was there problems at that time? or? The, well, obviously there were some kind of problems. I was right. talking to her about it. Yeah. Uh, but I didn't think, you know, she was quick. She wanted, psh, she was quick to say, hey, get out. Sounded like she liked you. <laughs> well, it, it, it sounded, you know, there were, there, I don't know that she liked me or what it was, but she was all in favor of me getting out. You know, what, you know I what I like about therapists is if you see them, you see your therapist at a, like a Laker game or in the market, you can't talk to them. Like it's not, it's against It's like when you were a kid and you saw your teacher out you somewhere. Can't, yeah. I can't talk to you right now. Like, yeah. you know, I saw my therapist hitting golf balls and uh, I had to pretend I didn't see him. Well, you know, you say that I, in an elevator in another <laughs> building, I saw her personal secretary and I said, hey, hey, how's it going? And, and she kind of ignored me. I said, well, what the fuck? How about fuck? that? Like, it's, it's like a, it's like a, a known thing if you... So your therapist fine. has a flat tire, and you go, oh, man, I'd like to help you, but... Right, and then the next week, she goes, how are you feeling? And, and you get to say, how are you feeling? I saw you... I saw you car trouble? Yeah. Deflated. So I, I, I went back to the therapist, and she says, hey, I understand you ran into my secretary because she came and told me, and she said she kind of ignored you because that client relationship, she didn't want anybody in the elevator to know that if they know me and I'm the secretary for the therapist, you're going to see the shrink. And she says, I just told my secretary, nah, just Gil. He doesn't give a shit who knows anything about what he's doing. He's just a nice guy. He's go ahead and talk to him. So I, I went to her, and then I stopped going to her. I did a television, you know, when they used to send cameras, kind of like cops. Right. They, we had a camera crew following us around at Homicide, and we'd done some stuff. And It's wild, man. And, and, and so, Isn't it crazy? It, yeah. And back when he was a detective, not, not so much now, but if somebody, if he was on a murder case, they would go to the coroner's office and be there during the autopsy. Oh, they still do. They do, still have. To oh, do they that. still do that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, because it's part of the detective work to see. Yeah. If they're, what are you guys looking for? Well, we're there to give the doctor first hand what we know, what we picked up that they don't have the knowledge of, because we were at the crime scene, they weren't. And so when they see uh, an injury, you know, they they said, "Hey, the guy got hit right here in the head. You know, graze wound in the head, hmm. and that ain't a graze wound. You know, that's what he got uh. shot over here." He went, drove half a block, went into a pole. That's his rearview mirror. That's what caused that. Oh, okay. So now, you know, you just. So so know. I think this is maybe what it's like to have OCD too in this. Remember when somebody would get shot up and they would go in there and they would put the strings connecting mm-hmm. where the bullet sure. started. Trajectory. Trajectory. So they're putting in string what you would put in your head. 
Like you would walk in there. If you were, like, I'll allow is it. there an OC? Isn't Monk? It wasn't Monk an OCD detective. Yeah. And he and he probably still is. Yeah, I think he, it was great. I mean, syndication. It wasn't any. Yeah, of course. I'm the good doctor does that. By the way, by the way, sees it all in his head. And they it's and they put it on head. graphics. <laughs> you know, you see him start mentally doing, and then they put it on graphics. What's going through his mind? What he can see. That's what I'm saying. I, I think that you can animate that. I, I you know, I we, yeah, it I is. Think, did I always use a red string? No. no. The uh, <laughs> the the. But I think in people's heads, it's connecting patterns in a way. That's right. Yeah, and they're, and they're doing it. Literally, because you, you have to show your partner, and but I, isn't isn't a hunch part of like a behavior thing of an OCD thing? Of, a, of you a, had a hunch that I had a, I wasn't an only child. Yeah, I made uh, I made it uh, I made an a uh, I took an a, I took a chance and said yeah like like uh, we were in here the guy that caught Whitey Bulger uh, Scott was in Scott here, and uh, he he had a hunch but he didn't want to go. He said I'm with my kids at Dick Sporting Goods and I get a call that this guy in Santa Monica was like oh fuck. I'm like, come on, come on, my kids, I'm a dick sporting goods. And then he had like an inkling, if they even, you know, that it might be the guy. I better call, better do something. Yeah. And he had a bunch of dicks. And then they, they and then they had to come up with a with a with a way for him to leave his apartment when he didn't leave the apartment. Whitey. I Whitey. think that fu- the funniest Whitey. part of that whole story was a guy that the the building manager said, Would well, you go knock on his door? He said, No, I ain't gonna knock on his door. He said, Why not? He said, I looked him up on Google, found out he had killed all these people. I ain't going to go knock on his door. <laughs> also, that guy tried to play stupid, and he said, don't don't play stupid with me, because mother, I'll take you in, too. Remember that? Yeah. The guy like, yeah. this guy live here? I don't know. He goes, you don't know if he lives here? Oh, he lives here. You seen him? I haven't seen him in a long time. And it's like the guy was covering for him, which mm-hmm. makes you kind of make you an accessory, especially when you're FBI. You can arrest anybody. You know, I, I listened to... Uh, him talk about his grandfather and, you know, orchestra and put it all together. Whenever I worked a murder, it's like being a conductor of an orchestra and that I don't know how to play every instrument in the orchestra. I don't know how to do serology. I don't do the ballistics. I don't They do that. But as a conductor, I know I need a little more serology. I need a little more oh, brass good. over here. I need some physical Con- evidence over here. Like a conductor. I pull it all together, then we make beautiful music together. I'm the one that makes the presentation of this orchestration. That's what my investigation consists of. Hey. I know what they do. Good. Poetic. Yeah, and bring it bring it yeah. all together. Yeah. I think it is, right? Sure. That's what I thought it was. Yeah, when you when you're surrounded by people that are good at what they do, it's you know, on a much smaller scale, but that's kind of what I was talking about with the podcast, where you don't have to do th- things for people, but you trust that like, here's what I want you to do, and then they do it. Yes, and then and then they then there's a harmony that they they can help you with stuff. I know what they can do. They have the capability of doing. Then it's my just give me your piece, give me your piece, yeah. give me this, and we make music together. But also, you know, in a podcast, much like unlike TV, if a show is um, is good, but every show it takes a while to get going, you would you could be eliminated in a week. You could be eliminated in uh, in four episodes. Yep. So you know, it's it's. Uh, if you're a person that worries about things, it, it it's agonizing. There's a difference between worrying and caring um, and uh, having a lot of intention behind something versus being afraid it might not work. Mm-hmm. Um, and I... F- but also the more moving parts, the larger your, you know, the strays or somebody that, you know... Yeah, this is a really corny, s- s- what I'm about to say, but it's when it's art, and I do believe... This is art. I think anything we're creating is art and there's choices to be made. If you're making choices, if you have intention behind everything you're doing, it works. Right. And that maybe has gotten in my way. But also you could do a thousand of your of, of take your shoes off and and you'd be cool with it. Where whereas if you had um a studio or a, a production company. Because you also have to be good though. Yeah. But also there, there's good shows that that don't that don't continue. Yeah, and I don't know the business well enough to understand. I mean, the Seinfeld that. Chronicles was not successful, and it was on NBC, and they pulled it off. And then somebody said uh, we ought to put it back up and just change it a little bit. Mm-hmm. And they took Chronicles out and just called it Seinfeld. And then, you know, um, much like a lot of standups, I believe that, you know, the standup is usually the weakest link in the cast. Which you have Jason Alexander. Uh, um, Michael Richards, Tim and Allen, right? They're all, all incre- incredible actors. And Jerry Seinfeld was Michael the, was a stand-up. Yeah, was he? Yeah, yeah. He was a stand-up. Uh, 
Yeah, he was a stand up. Yeah, he had that big controversy when he. Uh, no, I know that. Okay. But I mean, that's so good. Well, a stand up doesn't act like that. So I would say yeah. he wasn't a stand up. He did he did character stuff. I think that's certainly the A stand up would for. never act like that. A guy who's out of his element, who's overwhelmed, would. And he had an anger, had anger issues. Uh, we, we did the Aspen Comedy Festival. Mendoza and Margaret Cho and all of us, and uh, it was around Christmas, and Michael Richards came in on a sled, like dogs were pulling him into like fake snow. Love props. <laughs> and, he, and he came in on the sled and got out and uh, did like 10 minutes of incredible material. They, they stopped, they were talking to him, and this motherfucker just goes off. They had to redo it again. You motherfucker, for 20 minutes. Well, up, upstairs, I have the doors closed, you could hear him. And he was just like, you fucking motherfucking assholes, you fucking cocksuckers, you fucking piece of shit. And he did it again. It wasn't as good. Of course not. And uh, stand-up doesn't do that. No, that makes sense. We'll be right back. rest my case. <laughs> and we'll be right back. <laughs> a stand-up would never do that. It's like, you know, a policeman never, gives, never loses his gun. A stand-up never goes there. I'll tell you something, on my podcast... I would have now have animated. He's got a gun on his head the entire time. And right when you say that, it drops. <laughs> no, it's in your hand. Did you, I'm, I'm sorry, I took this from you. <laughs> you got eight hours of figuring that out. <laughs> so what do you, so what do you, what, what makes you, what makes you the happiest? Or what, no, let me see. What doesn't annoy you as much? Let me, let me. I think <laughs> I can, so an, I think I can answer the, 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 uh, it, within a scope of that. Um, How big can a podcast get? Like Joe Rogan? I think Joe Rogan going to Austin and changing a little bit in the higher profile. Um, yeah. I mean, Joe Rogan and like My Favorite Murder are probably the top two podcasts. So if you get a $100 million deal, you're the top podcast. What's yeah. great about podcasts and was one of my uh, intentions going into this was to build something. We're opposites in this. You have an audience. You're bringing them to your podcast. I am. I started using my podcast as a means to build an audience because stand up has always been an obstacle for me, um, in a very good way, and I'm grateful for it, and I love it, and I think I could be at least really good at it. I, I'm, a, I'm a good stand up now. Um, I believe that I have a lot of place to grow, uh, go and grow, and and I I have this insecurity of showcasing myself. I don't want people to come and pay to see me because it's not ready. And there's a there's a ba- sure it's not ready, but how are you going to get ready? Um, through circumstance, I ended up building this podcast and I've built this audience now that wants to come see me. And that's what I want. I love that somebody wanted to take a picture with me. And I love that they already knew enough. To give you respect, of, give you space. Which translates to me, I'm assuming, because I have yet Makes to- Makes you very happy. And uh, there's, a, there's an interview with Johnny Carson. I forgot who did it, but he's talking to him about um, respect and earning the audience trust. And he was, Johnny Carson was talking about how Bob Newhart will go on stage and- Relatively speaking, he doesn't have to earn it right. They are, it's his to lose. He, he, they go and say they like him already. But a comedian that if we don't know who you are, they're not against me necessarily, but I have to get them to like me. Right. So I'm excited for, for that thing of going on stage and they already know enough to where I don't have to get out all this exposition. You know what I mean? Right. So the, how big could a podcast be? Yeah, I guess Rogan. But specifically, if I could grow my podcast to a point to where people want to see me Right, it makes you happy. I mean, what's what's the, what's the success of of things? You know, when somebody gets to be that big, um, you know, you look at somebody like Michael Jackson or Prince, like the, you know, the vanity in themselves Musicians? destroyed. They, they were a long time ago. Um, the, their vanity destroys their their livelihood. You know, I think Prince had a bad hip, and he didn't want to go and get it go get it looked at again. He had hip surgery. And instead of, because of who he thought he was, but he's still a human being, he didn't want to be perceived as weak or go to the hospital to go get it back, to go get it done again. And oh. he didn't do it. And he looked to, for medication, so to self-medicate. And then he, he got caught with some bad shit. But I mean, to a guy who was so meticulous about the way he dressed and the way yeah. he was, and though he was very clean and the things that had to be in his dressing room, you know, I hung out with him. It just very meticulous about everything more more so than anybody that i've that i've seen and even just the way his hands look like he's just kind of like just perfect you know and, and the guy that if he had gone to the hospital uh and had it done because back in those times i mean it's like a long time ago when they did hip replacements they you would have to go back in maybe once or twice you know the guy from kiss we know paul stanley and he lost a half an inch on his like left leg because the doctor didn't do the right thing he had to go back in there and they had to readjust it so now the hip 
socket didn't hurt, but in the process of it, he lost like a half an inch of his leg. Oh, wow. But he was he, but he wasn't in any pain. Mm. And Prince was performing, and he was performing in pain. And then you're looking to kind of find medications and things, and you just get kind of caught short. I mean, it's just kind of you become an addict to something that you never thought you would you would be doing. But your injury, and even when that night that he landed that plane, and he said, you know, they said, don't go anywhere, man, because like the next 48 hours are crucial when someone almost ODs. And he, within 48 hours, he was gone. So they were, ta- so the, you know, they're telling you, and if you're fighting, if you're fighting that, then your vanity or your, 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 your you're going to, you destroy yourself. It's, it's interesting that vanity is a, is a thing that we choose in a way, but uh, it's in us, but the parts that we can control, it's kind of made up. This is our, like, this is, this is the, the brand that I think I'm supposed to be selling. So that's what you have to start selling. And I think there's something really efficient in the reality of showcasing your weaknesses. And I think podcasts in particular are a, are a kind of a shift in this. Not only is mental, mental uh, health awareness uh, trendy, and I use that both you know, in a good way, but also like people want to talk about that stuff in a way where it's now a hot button thing. People are now proud of their weaknesses and their obstacles in a way that I think is, is good, but it's almost forced uh, to where hey, guess what? I'm actually bad at doing this. And that becomes part of your vanity right. and part of your brand. Um, I've had podcasts go out that I was embarrassed about, but it was a lot easier to put out because there's less to control. And then people, see, because of my weaknesses, people now accept that of me and they take the picture from far away. I mean, it's a stupid small example I already right, gave. Right. But vanity is, 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 is a good overcome is, uh, is being confident in your obstacles. And I think podcasts and these conversations have kind of opened that up, at least in the comedy world. I think, I think absolutely. I think that it, that it has. I mean, you know, even the therapy that, you know, when those guys, I don't know what the name of you said it was, that, that you would have somebody you could talk to on the Better Health on the, on the phone, is yeah. I think is, mm-hmm. which I think is, uh, is good. You know, we don't come from a culture where, where, where therapy is an option. I was, you know, I was raised by my grandparents, and mm. I don't think they really ever give a fuck what I thought or what I liked or disliked ever. They never asked me, do you like this? They would just buy what they bought and we'd eat what we ate and we'd go where we go. And I never had a say in saying, I don't want to go there. Well, fuck you then, then stay home. And I think in, and it makes you feel in, in, insignificant growing up. And I think part of being insignificant for me was I, in reducing me, you just made me want to kind of have my, find my own place. I never said that before, but you know, I was always the one that was overlooked. You know, my parents, uh, my friends' parents would either pick me up for a baseball game or not pick me up. And if they didn't pick me up, then I had to walk. And I was usually late. And I was always overlooked. So I think being overlooked and being undermined and being underappreciated or ignored just creates somebody that will not be ignored or will not be, um, uh, I'll just work harder than everybody else. If you if no, If they don't see it, I'll make you see it. And... In, that kind of contradicts, but it makes sense. The idea of once something's hard, you would quit. But right. But you, uh, you were. Uh, but I got afraid that message at the right time. Yeah, I got that message at the right time because yeah. I didn't analyze it like people analyze shit now. Mm-hmm. But if I look back, I would say, well, what made you keep going back? And it was like, well, what were my options? I mean, it was something that I like to do. Wasn't a great writer. Were you uh, good at it then? Did you feel was, like you know you know what the, you know what the guys would say? Like they would say. The guys who other comics, the, the other comics, like the guys. They say when you smile, man, like you just bring everybody in. So I wasn't a strong writer then, but I guess I had a, a bit of charm. You know, like if I smiled, everybody was happy. Did you use that as a tool? Did no. you try to smile? No. When you guys write your own material, do you practice it on other comedians, or do you tell somebody, "Hey, listen to this"? You tell well, your jokes to let somebody. Me tell a lovely story about when I was hosting the Emmys in 2005, and Mayan's yeah. mother. Looked at my notes and said to me on the Saturday, the Emmys were on a Sunday, you're not doing this, are you? And I said, <laughs> oh, yeah. She goes, oh, my God. You, you're not going to fucking say this, are you? I go, give me the papers back. This is awful. I, I hope you. I hope this is not what you're going to do. Uh, can I have my papers back? Okay. So I'm working on it, and it was what I was doing. And I gave away the first Emmy for uh, reality TV. And I went out there, and I said, uh, you know, they had uh, uh, Extreme Makeover, in an hour, you're beautiful. And I said, you know, isn't that what a 12-pack does? <laughs> and, uh, 
you know, and I, and I said some other some other ones. And when we, <laughs> you know, they make you sit in the audience until it's time to come and get you. So the Sopranos were there, Will and Grace, Six Feet Under, everybody That's was cool, Raymond, man. Uh, Robin Williams, Jamie Foxx, Gandolfini, uh, everybody who's everybody uh, at that time. Mm -hmm. And they come and get me, and I get up, and then Ann gets up, and I said, oh, no, no, no. No, no, you stay here. What? He goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you have to stay here. Why? Um, you burned your backstage pass yesterday, is what I told her. <laughs> I'm going to go by myself. Because I, I can't have you in there if you don't think, that you, if you don't think what I'm going to say is funny. So you stay here. And uh, I went back there. Yeah, I was fucking scared to death, man. It's 2005, you know. Scared. Scared to present. Yeah, right. the fucking Emmy. So, you know, fucking right. five years ago, I was in the clubs doing fucking stand-up. Yeah. yeah. Just with nobody knowing me. So, oh, fuck, man. <clears throat> I was there, and the, you know, and I fucking looked out there like that. And Robin Williams was in the middle of the aisle. And he saw me, and he went like this. Oh, oh cool, man. man. <laughs> and I looked, and I said, fuck, man. And I did it. That, that helped you? It, it, did, it, was, it meant everything. You, it meant everything because I, it gave, it made, he, he was like land. Like at that time. Had he done that? Himself, had he hosted it? No. Okay. But at that time, I would have imagined like you were out there in the middle of the ocean. Yeah. And like, fuck, man. I just need to see some land. Like, how the, mm -hmm. which way do I go? And I looked out there and he saw me and him doing that. Like, come on, motherfucker. Like that. It, 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 it was like seeing la land. Hey, land. And it took away. Awesome. The nerves that I might have that I might have had. You brought up Robin Williams, and it just popped in my head because when you were talking about your smile, I watched Awakenings last night. I've, I'd never seen it before, oh. and I rewound a couple of times because uh, the way he smiled, and there's a smile that I was trying to like, I was like trying to, I don't know, copy it, but kind of mm -hmm. like, there's something mm -hmm. really engaging and sincere about his smile, and I just. Me, not as an actor, me, I don't smile the way he does. I couldn't do, and like, that's a smile, man. And when you were saying that, it made me think of him, and then you told that Robin story. So check this out. Rob Small world. Yeah. <laughs> but, but you brought that up because you can't do, you, you can't perform jokes for people not on stage because it'll just make you, you don't want to second guess, right? Is that what you're getting some, at? Yeah, I couldn't have somebody, so I wouldn't, so I wouldn't test anything on anybody. Mm. And I would do it, and afterward, I'd go, fuck, what'd you think of that? And I, you know, brand new, I had it, brand new, you know. But I would never tell anybody. What's the best case scenario if I, hey, do you think this is funny? Best case scenario, you go, yeah. And that'll never be enough. <laughs> and even if they said yes, and it wasn't, you'd be like, what the fuck did I ask you for? <laughs> It's, it's a lose-lose. No yeah. yeah, there's no way you can win. Yeah, because then you go up on stage, and you had already delivered it to somebody who was like, yeah. And you just. Mm -mm. But you're, you know, the, the, the process of being a club comedian and then getting a little bit of a bite because what I, what, what, what I would remember is going to the comedy store, the Laugh Factory, the improv, and seeing guys who had deals who almost like a secretarial pool got pulled out of the secretarial pool, did the whole thing, the show was on two weeks, and they'd go back, and the luster of them was gone. Like, it, like the, the, the newness of them mm -hmm. was removed because they got into the machine and the machine spit them out. And they didn't come back the same. Like only attracted to a virgin type I, of thing. Yeah. And they didn't come back the same. They weren't as funny. They are a little bit bitter, a little bit jaded. And, and they just became guys that they were back in the hopper. You and, recognize this before your, your show? Yeah. Were you scared about that? Well, I, 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 I thank God I saw it because I said, fuck this, man. I'm going to work so hard that I'm going to – I don't think those guys – I don't think those guys worked as hard. I don't think they – if they had as much say, they didn't use it. They didn't. They were just happy to be to be going along. I wasn't. I was happy to be going along, but I was going to work harder than everybody else to make sure that I stayed out there as long as I could. I have a question for you. I came in here on your podcast, and I'm asking questions about the camera and the seating position and trying to make myself feel comfortable, but not overstep too much. And that's a balance. When you're on your show and it's your show, but it's new still. And like you said, you, 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 you wanted to put your feedback in. Was there something that you learned how you could be heard, but making sure it's respectful Yeah. and not, you know, because then the question makes sense. What, 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 could you give me advice? In, in, in a sitcom? I don't just mean, well, be nice to people. Well, I mean, but specifically, also, but let me, hold on, let me, let me ask, because okay. I, I don't think I was clear right. enough. 
you're doing your show and, and I don't the know. Stand-up or the TV show? The TV show. All right. Right, where there's a lot more moving parts. Right. And you have a vision that's not being met. But it's also, the other one isn't wrong, and these people wrote this, and the director, blah, blah, blah. You have to have certain instincts of no, pick, picking your battles, right? Yeah. And then there's a moment where you're like, I, I can't have it this way, but it might make me look. Okay, that's a great question. Yeah. So, so um, the one of the actresses said, who, who writes this? And I said, uh, we're going to take... Uh, I'm gonna take a five minute break. Guys go, I put I take her in the room with the other producers. And I said, listen, you, you, you can't say that in front of the oh, crew. Oh, who writes it like judging? And you can't say that in front of the writers. And you can't say it in front of me. If you don't fucking like it, make a note, talk about it after, come to us. Don't fucking say that shit in front of me. I created the show. Don't say it in front of him. He created the show. He created mm-hmm. Drew Carey. He created, uh, w- worked on shows you haven't, I haven't, but I have enough respect for the writers to know that it's a process. And if you don't like the way it is right now, then graduate, cu- pull somebody out to the side and we'll replace it. But you don't say who writes this shit in front of everybody, mm-hmm. especially in front of me. And uh, worked it out. There was a fucking AD that would sit there with a moving pedestal. This, you know, we're moving to the factory and you're doing like that. <clears throat> and underneath his fucking um, fucking podium, he would be eating scrambled eggs or a bagel. And I, I worked in a factory, and I would. And the rule was, when we do the table read, no eating, no fucking. You can have coffee, but no food. These motherfuckers would come over there on other shows with eggs, and they're turning the page with a fork in their hand. No eating. Nobody eating during the fucking thing. We're working. When you work, do you eat? You fucking eat when you're on break. You eat after the, the table read. And I couldn't, I told this guy, and I was young, you know, first year. And I told him, pulled him into the room, his AD room didn't look like I was chastised, he was in there. And I went in there and I said, can I talk to you? And he said, yeah, I closed the door. And I said, listen, man, me and him. I said, I, you know, I don't like when you eat when we're rehearsing because we're working. Now, if you want to eat, you can eat before, you can eat at lunch, you can eat on a break. He goes, you serious? I said, I'm serious. Okay, I'm serious. And later on in the season, I looked over, and he was fucking eating, and he saw me, and he put it under like he hit it. And after every season, we would go into a room, and we would go through everybody who worked on the show, and we would say, Grant. Uh-oh. Yes. All right. Gil. Yes. Such and such. Yes, yes, yes. No. What? No. What do you mean, no? I mean, no. I said, I asked this guy. Not to eat when we were rehearsing. He ate for that. I said, listen, we're working, okay? You're fucking here in your office. Are you down over there with me? I'm on the court. You see a motherfucking Lakers out there with a fucking half a sandwich? <laughs> like, fucking, you're working. And I fired him. And that guy was pissed, shocked. And uh, he didn't talk to me. I did an award show that I was hosting. And he's standing there, and he's not talking to me, got the headset on, and he has, he's the one that's car- taking me to where I need to stand, and we're both standing there, and he's not looking at me, and I'm not looking at him, and I go, what'd you have to eat today? <laughs> <laughs> I know it's not the point, but I gotta, I gotta know. What is it about him eating? Um, because is it, Do you find it disrespectful? Do you find fact- it distracting? I worked in a factory. You didn't eat when you were working. You but, worked when you were working. But that was a... F- because I think it's sloppy. It's distra- It's a fucking distraction. So you're also, distracted. Also, cell phones were starting, and I wouldn't let anybody use the phone on the stage. Because I was rehearsing one time, and I'm looking at an actor, and over her shoulder, I see that one of the moms you know, like this, and you know, looking around, and I'm like, okay, wait, wait, wait. And that was early. No, no cell phones, no eating, no nothing. 120 shows. Any other Latino sitcom that was successful was fucking two shows. Paul Rodriguez went on fucking two weeks. I went 120, and I did it nicely, but if I had to be tough with somebody, I was tough with them because if it was for the good of the show and not for the good of me. So the advice would be, do what's best for the show and not bet, and most comedians do what's best for them. Um, you do what's best for the show. Yeah, you know, uh, 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 as an actor, I could tell you that it's sometimes it's difficult to know what's best um, for the scene but versus create, what's best for the character. For your creator, though. For an actor, yeah. you have to read the but words that are given to you. But but as a creator, 
I had the power to be able yeah. to tell somebody not to eat. Yeah. 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 You know, uh, if, if you told me that and it's your show, I listen to you. But as an actor, I wouldn't tell you because it's not my show. Right. But I'm just saying, if, I'm just saying like trying to con- connect to that and like... I would listen to you about the eating thing because, but I don't connect to, I didn't work in a factory and my blood sugar gets low. I can't do my job well. Sometimes I have to have a bite of something. That would be part of the communication. I try to eat better. That's right. But like, yeah, that's, that's, I don't know if like. Here, let me give you another, another thing. So we were, we were starting, they were starting to, we went to an airplane parts factory. The show was about airplane parts factory. Mm -hmm. Went to an airplane parts factory. We saw a guy, the boss. We based kind of the boss on that guy, mm-hmm. big dude, alcoholic guy. You could tell, he's fucking big, loud, non-union, and. Uh, could you say that now? Oh man, this dude was, he was rough, man. He brought a Latino guy over. He goes, "Hey, Felipe, we don't need a union here, no, sir. We don't need Nazi. You know, like <laughs> the fucking thing like that. We were, that became we a joke. No that became union. a joke in the room, you know. So, so um, they're starting to kind of buy the machines for the factory and starting to put the kitchen together. And then they're starting to put the, the furniture in there. And um, I'm in the writer's room, and I, I get a note that they want to see me on the stage. So there was a woman that worked with Bruce Alford, his producing partner. And there's a, a lady that worked in the office. She's half Mexican. And they're both like this, looking at the kitchen. And I go, what's going on? And the woman says, uh, George, yeah, you know, Brenda is half Mexican. And we're looking at the kitchen. And we agree that there's nothing in the kitchen that says to us that a Latino or a Mexican family lives there. And I said, oh, yeah. And then I got up and I went into the middle of the kitchen. And I went like this. How about now? <laughs> now does it look like a Mexican family lives here? <laughs> and uh, they said, uh, "Yeah, we apologize." You know, I said, "Why does why does our kitchen have to look like a fucking Mexican family lives in it?" And she, and the lady goes, "Well, there's not a tortilla maker on the stove." I said, Ooh. "I said, are you fucking serious?" I said, "My tortilla maker." lives in the house that I grew up in, my grandmother. She goes, no, like one of those things that you, mm-hmm. I said, we're not, gonna, we're not gonna be that. We're not gonna be that show. And I said, listen, and if I see any fucking glasses with fucking chili peppers on them and everything, and they both go like this, I go, what? I go over to the fucking drawer, I open it up, there's a pitcher in there with four glasses that have red chili peppers in there. Mm-hmm. I, have a I qu- said, we, I have, could, we could do this. I have a question for you, and uh, we don't know each other, so, I feel like this is the most personal question. Am I militant? You. Do you think I'm over the top? Um, I, I honestly don't have a take. I think that you know what you want, and you're mm-hmm. a creator, and there's nothing. That's only a good thing. Um, if it works, right? Yeah, it works. My question for you uh, is, uh, and I'm not meaning to project this. I'm really no, no. asking. Yeah, good. Is there something that this is your first shot, right? This is your this is your into a network, you know, a, a mainstream thing. Is there a part of you that was avoiding that on purpose because you don't want, you're already there, you don't want too much of this to I be I wasn't avoiding on purpose, I was avoiding it with a reason. Because all the other shows that, even if you look at Christella, whatever that show was named, if you look at the, if you look at her kitchen was orange and blue and red and vibrant, my kitchen looked like right. anybody's kitchen. Right. And those were the things that were important to me. Yeah. That, that we as a family became us as a family. If it was a, a Jewish family, you wouldn't, you know, somebody walking in with a big loaf of bread under. <laughs> I like that's your, your first I, thought of a yeah, Jewish person. I, I, <laughs> you the thing, you know. Uh, so that, that uh, So I you did, wanted to make sure that, like that this isn't uh, a Latino show. It's a show with a Latino. Yeah. And you, th- you were conscious of that from the beginning. Mm-hmm. Because they would, have put, they would have put that in everything. And, you know, it's funny, you right. know, Anne, when I was married, Aunt Mine's mother, the, uh, and I didn't really have a voice in the beginning, you know, and she did, but she, you know, she had, she had that voice wherever we were. It didn't have to be in a, in a, in a business like setting, yeah. but, but what she did, what, but what she did was she would read the scripts while I was already asleep. 
in the morning I would wake up and look like a fucking Russian newspaper. There would be like no X with fucking no fucking shit circled bullshit. Fuck this. Like your Oscars. Never, like like that. Like that. Oh, yeah, like the fucking that. and I didn't like that she did that. But the thing that she said was, "You and Bruce have kids, and you're creating a show that your kids can't watch." And she's like, this is this is some bullshit. I mean, she said, like, did you work this fucking hard to be able to have a show? What's an that example is about of something that they couldn't see? A joke. D- d- dick jokes. Right. And fucking Mambo King shit that's fucking Cuban and all that bullshit. And I was like, this ain't, we're not going to do this. And yeah. they were like, what? And I had to explain it to, I, don't, I didn't explain it to the whole writer's room. I explained it to my partners, Bruce and Robert. And they got it. They go, all right, you're right. And I said, we don't know. And I said, well, it's not that you don't know. Just treat me like a regular fucking person, man. You don't have to put this shit in there. Just, let's, let's just write uh, stories. And they were trying to write Latino stories. There was a guy that wrote for Cheers that I met with at Paramount. And he's like, I'm sorry, man. I don't know how to write for somebody Latino. I said, but don't you write for just right. fucking people? You're right. Mm-hmm. And he apologized later on. He, I saw him and he said he was sorry. But would he have said he was sorry if I didn't make it? No. We were in the same room, and he's like, remember me? I, th- I said, oh, he goes, hey, man, I'm sorry. I, I said, how fucking stupid was I to say that? Like, yeah, well, I mean, that's... But, you know, you have to hold on to your beliefs, but not all of them, but what's good for the show. Like, those things would have not made me very comfortable. And I was in a position as a creator that I could yeah. say, we're not going to do this because it's expected of us. And then when they started to write... Characters like a babysitter. It was always a Latina girl. That's a bad babysitter. And I said, "Hey, we're not we're not going to do this either. We're just we're going to spread it all out. We're going to have different people of different color, and we're not going to make because they were making the brown people the bad people, just because that's the way they wrote. Yeah, and that's the way they saw shit. It's a much smaller example, or at least to scale, I th- I believe. But to uh, scale. well, because <laughs> because I've only seen this a couple couple of times. But uh, Sarah Silverman uh, recently talked yeah. about on her podcast about how a lot of J- Jewish women in particular, they're always, oh, the, the nag. And mm-hmm. just like she doesn't she didn't like that. And I recognize that. I don't have a, a, a big take on this. No, but, but I recognize but, it when she brought up. I was like, oh, right. Because for whatever reason, people saw these people this way because that was the first way they saw them. And then that's the only way they saw them. When when I was married, I, I told Anne that. I said, you might, you might not like going to the movies with me. And she goes, why is that? I said, because if I go to a movie and I see a, a fucking Latino being demeaned, I'm going to leave. Where are you going to go? I'm, I'm going to get up and leave the movie. Watch your basic instinct, knock on the door, the two detectives say, so is this Kathleen, Catherine, uh, whatever her name was, um, uh, Sharon Stone? No, senor. Where are you going? Fucking left the theater. I said, I told you, I'm not going to fucking sit here and watch movies where. How would you like us to call immigration? You know, I'm watching you right now performing. Like you're, maybe you've done this before, but it sounds like you're just finding the getting up thing. Yeah. And you found it when you went over there. And even the way you get up, each time you get up is the same like way, a like, a, like a bit, like yeah. a pattern. And it's like, this yeah. guy fucking knows yeah. how to sell. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. But I think my, I'm out. Yeah, it's, like, right. oh, it's just uh, you're calling it you're back. Like, like the fifth, fifth time. All right. Here I go. But you know, uh, I think instinctually, you know, I wasn't a physical type comedian, but in the writing of things, things take, they take, they, they start to form, mm-hmm. you know. In detective work, you pull up, you can see shit that nobody can see. And uh, it's funny, like Richard Ramirez, you know, he would do shit in the house, you know, do stuff. And then when he when they caught him, he said, did you find that uh, shit that I took? Yeah. He goes, not in the house. And he goes, no. He goes, outside? He goes, yeah, outside by the... So... I don't know what you're talking about. I'm sorry. Sometimes criminals, they... They, they do things that are unexpected. You know, they, they go... <laughs> It, and it's a sexual, it's a sign of sexual deviancy. In this case, some people go inside residences where they burglarize. Right. And they defecate in some place other than the toilet, maybe on the living room carpet, maybe in the bedroom, on the bed. Well, Richard actually asked me, the serial killer asked me, did you see where I took a shit? And I said, you didn't take a shit inside that house. He said, no, no, no. And he then says, he said, outside. Outside. By the bush. I said, by the window. He says, Yeah. And I said, I thought it was a dog. 
you know, but it, he was proud of it. You know, that was part of his. But which is cool because he knew. I just didn't know it was his. And, yeah, yeah. He goes by the window, so he knew that if he would have said no, I never found it. Like he's like, all right, oh, so they're both doing their thing. But also, if an actor came in and had, like, you know, we would tell them not to do accents, and they couldn't do it. They would, it would see like, hey, you don't have to read this with an accent. And they would, you know how they stand up with the papers, you know, they have the paper, they come in, and they're like, okay, um, you ready? It goes, oh, by the way, you don't have to read this with an accent. And they go, oh, and they were looking through this. Oh, hang on a second. Uh, okay. Um, you want to take a couple minutes? Yeah, can I? Because in their head, they just thought they had to right. have an accent. Right. And um, even the woman that played my mom, who was a great acting teacher and in the beginning, and she's like... We don't have to use an accent. I said, no, of course not. She, she was goes, great. I knew. That. Benny? Yeah. She goes, I knew, I knew you wouldn't have to fuck. I said, yeah, that's right. No, use your fucking, use your voice. You don't have an accent. Mm -hmm. She was awesome. Well, and I hate to be time cop, but I know you have a, another commitment today, George. Fuck so. him. What time is it? Uh, it's almost four. Oh, shit. It's about to start returning. Go by fast. Yeah. Well, this is fun, man. I think this is the fastest two I, hours. Yeah, uh, it definitely has. I, I was fascinated. I was, I was fascinated listening to you. Thank you. It was fun. It was you a know what, man? I get you, man. you, man. I get you, dude. Thank you. I'm gonna tell you that. I don't really say that to a lot of people, but I, I a little emotional. I get, I get you. Uh, yeah, that got me. Uh, th that's nice. Thanks, man. Yeah, I, I think. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> so thanks for coming. Oh, this no, is this is you know really nice. You know why? Because I I know what it takes to be good, and I know when things are natural. How tough that can be. Yeah, well, this was cool. Um, I love to, I love to have you on, and we'll have a goblin shitting on you with big dicks. <laughs> <laughs> You're old enough to well, see that now, right? Yeah. Dicks. All right. How about that, man? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, this was great. Thank you, man. Thanks, Rick. All right. I appreciate Cheers. you, brother. Thank you. Awesome.